All right, so here we are. It is recording, and right now I'm sitting. So for those that are for those that are out of the loop, you're listening to Death Waves on WGMUradio.com. This is the first ever Zoom recorded interview that we are doing, so I'm actually really happy to be doing this. And with and my first guest for this Zoom interview is. Believe it or not, the founding member of Motorhead, the one, the only, Mr. Lucas Fox. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great, mate. And it is, this, is, this is a real pleasure to be speaking to your listeners. I hope you're all safe there, yeah. out there. And, and please mask up and rock out in this rock down situation. Oh, it's, man. It's, 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 it's lovely to be talking to you. And, and, and all of you gals and guys out there, I hope you're well and happy and, and having, a, having a good time. Because, uh, you know, I mean... Let's face it. Okay, everyone's going. Oh, this pandemic's awful. But I mean, in Europe, just just an example, historic example. In 1945, at the end of the Second World War, there were 35 million displaced people in Europe, and and we managed to get through that. Yeah. Uh, we managed, you know, all the deaths and all the awful things in the Second World War. I mean, 2,000 years of warring around Europe, and and we've managed to somehow come through it. We'll get through this as well. Um, but but we 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 have got to sort of you know shape up this this mask thing. I don't know how much it's advertised in the states. I know one side seems to be a bit uh, in denial of all this. Oh, but, I know. Um, Trust me, but, I live. But, I live. Yeah. But 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 um, I mean, in in the end, it's it's a very straightforward thing. If you look at Japan and the Asian countries who wear masks a lot lot without the pandemic they have a much lower rate of transmission of, of flu and, and common cold. So, so, so it's really, you know, this, this thing is transmitted by spit, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and, and, of and, course. And, and, you know, if, if you sneeze, did, I mean, I'll, I'll do a Michael Caine on you. Not a lot of people know this. But if, if, you, have, if you sneeze, that sneeze is going to go more than 10 metres. That's like 35 or 40 feet. Yes. And it's going to spread out just like, a, yes. just like buckshot. Yes. So, yeah. so it's going to spread out. So, so yeah. when you sneeze, it's going to hit like 10 people. Yes. And if, if you're in a crowd, it's probably going to hit 20 or 30 people. So, so that's why the mask is so simple. Gotcha. And, and anyway, I don't want to go on about that because we're not here to talk about health issues. But, but I care about people. Of and, 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 and the only way we're going to slow this damn thing down is by, by, a bit, be, be, is by being a bit care, careful about each other, you know? Of course, no, and, and that does make sense, and it's important to be mindful of the people around you during such a time, because you never know where everyone's been at. You never know. Well, well yeah, and, 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 and even with the testing and stuff, you get tested, and, and, and an hour later you bump into somebody, bang, you got it. You know? Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. So, 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 so voila. Anyway, let's, let's get on with the interview. It's, oh, great to, it's great to be here. It's a Sunday afternoon in Paris here, where I've oh, been based for, for 32 years. Nice. Um, I'm based here because the, um, the train network across Europe is so good. Um, I'm just down the road from a, a, a train station called Gare du Nord, okay. the, uh, the, 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 the northern train station in, in Paris. Okay. And uh, fr from there, in two hours, 10 minutes, I'm in central London. And I'm only 20 minutes walk from the, the, from the damn thing. Uh, also, I can be in Brussels in like an hour and a half. I can be in Amsterdam in two and a quarter hours. I can wow. be in south of France, France in Marseille in three and a half hours. I mean, it's just high speed rail. It's wonderful. I don't really take planes very much, um, no, of apart course. from obviously doing transatlantic. But, but tr the trains are a wonderful form of transport. Because if, if you haven't missed your train, then you've got uninterrupted pleasure for, for however long it is. You can go to the bar, you can work on your laptop, you can sleep, you can, you know, drink, whatever it is you want to do, yeah. apart from smoke dope, you know, but I mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know. Is it, how, how is the, how's the situation for that over there in France? Is it, is it fully legalized or is it like? No, a, no, 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 yeah. it's, it's, it's still completely hard ass here. Wow. I mean, where I, where, where I, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they've actually increased fines and, 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 and meant that um, basically uh, you get caught with a joint in France. It's just, that you can be hit. Um, by a policeman, not hit literally, because they don't do that too much here. No. Um, but um, but but you you can be hit with a fine, automatic fine, um, of like 130 euros, which is like 130 dollars or something. Something. Oh, like that's that. that's that's um, way more. That's probably 140 dollars because of the tax because of the conversion rates. Yeah, yeah, and 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 but so, so you can be hit, hit. It's just like a parking ticket. So yeah. you haven't even got to go to court or any of that stuff. It's just like a parking ticket. Bang, you're you're done. You're busted. You know, wow. so, 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 so that's really not healthy. 
Um, in Britain, where I come from, um, all the police commissioners who are the equivalent of your police chiefs, all of them right across the, the, the British Isles, went to the government and said, look, we haven't got the manpower to handle this. And people who smoke dope are basically very friendly. They usually <laughs> wanted to stay at home and watch DVDs and jerk off. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and they rarely drink because they're like quite, quite purist about it in general. Yeah. And they don't drink, drink and smoke. Um, they don't seem to drive too much. You know, so, so, so in which case it's not a problem. But if we have to bust them and put them in jail, then we are creating another problem because jail is one of the big universities in the world to teach you how not what to do, you know. Of course. <laughs> so, so, of course. so, I mean, you know, I've got nothing against people coming out of jail, but, but it's, it's one of those problems that in jail you learn an awful lot of stuff that you only need to know if you want to keep down that path, you know. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, we're, we're here to talk about music <laughs> and, and, and little old me, maybe. Uh, so, of course. <laughs> That's why. That's why. That's why I asked you to appear on this. <laughs> no, but <laughs> no, but uh, in all in all seriousness, though, for those that are out of the loop, Lucas, it, L Mr. Fox, right here, or Lucas, as he prefers to be called, he was he was a founding member of Motorhead and and played on several tracks that would go on to appear on the first Motorhead record, and he also played in the Lon in the London punk rock band Warsaw Pact. Uh, like I said, so for Motorhead, I remember reading on. I, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually go off the Wikipedia page for a second. I remember reading on the uh, Wikipedia page for you that you basically started Motorhead after picking up Lemmy from the London airport after he was sacked from Hawkwind in 1975. That's absolutely right. Um, How that, we, like, so explain me all of that. Cause that is my, when I read that, my, like that blew my mind. Well, it, it, it's, it, it depends where we, where you want to set the, uh, the, the, the start button for that story. Um, just tell me everything. I would love to like, like you want me to, you want me, you want me, me to reveal all, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not all, but just, but just what do you mean not all? I'm, I'm sure they want all the gory details. Well, and, hey, and quite, and quite right too. <laughs> if, if you want, all, if you want all the gory details, you can lay them on me. Okay. Uh, ha just, just, just a question. I, I know that uh, America is quite a, um, a, a conservative country from some ways. Yeah. Um, how is your how is your radio regarding swear words? Oh, hey, thank you for asking me that. I never actually managed to tell you. Keep it to a minimum. If not, don't swear. My radio station, unfortunately, is really strict on that. Fine. Okay. I just wanted to check that because 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 no, uh, I, I I tend to uh, tend to swear a lot because that's part of my nature. Not because it's um, um it's blasphemous or or because it's it's just I, I just think they're great words. And they're very expressive. Yes, they are. <laughs> you know, but, but, but I just wanted to check that because because I'm very sensitive to those sorts of things. And I don't want, you know, this radio program to be um, constantly going, blah, 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 beep, blah, 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 beep, <laughs> blah, 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 beep, which, which is a real pain. You know? Yeah, of course, of it's course. It's a pain, pain in the proverbial. <laughs> yes, it is. It, no, you're right. Not, you're... Not, not to name something which is an obvious part of our anatomy. No, of course. Something. So anyway, back to the question. <laughs> okay, so yes, um, Lemmy got kicked out of Hawkwind. Lemmy was in Hawkwind for four years. Yes, he was. And it was an accident that he got into Hawkwind in the first place. Lemmy was living with a mate of mine, a very close mate of mine afterwards, uh, Dick Mick. And Dick Mick, interesting enough, um, Dick, like your strange president Richard Nixon called Dickie, Tricky Dickie, right? Uh, it, Dick is a short, uh, short nickname for a person called Richard. So... Um, Dick Mick was called um, Richard, uh, sorry, he was called, yes, he was called um, uh, Richard Davies, right? There was another Richard Davies in his class at school. So to avoid confusion, they both became Dick Davies. Wow. And, and my mate, Dick Mick, was Richard Michael Davies. And of course, the Mick Jagger, the, the, the shortened version of Michael is Mick. Yes. So of course, Dick Mick became Dick Mick. <laughs> <laughs> Duck Muck. So, no. so that's Dick Mick. Dick Mick and Lemmy were living in a squat in Labrack Grove, this wonderful place, which is a bit like Haight-Ashbury in, okay. in San Francisco. There were only two, really two places like this in the world, possibly Soho in New York as well. Okay. Um, but as far as rock and roll goes, this is where we all lived. We all lived in this strange community. Of, of kind of hippies and 
ne'er-do-wells and, and a wonderful, wonderful Jamaican community because nice. uh, it was a Jamaican front, uh, front line. And, um, and uh, so uh, the, the, the community was basically a whole mix. It was a very, very poor housing situation. I mean, when I say poor, it was the same thing as Haight-Ashbury. Haight-Ashbury was all fallen down. Wow. And you, and you could pick up apartments for absolutely nothing. And I'm talking about renting because nobody had enough money to buy. Same here. But I mean, we're talking about street after street after street of ran down buildings with peeling wallpaper and, 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 um, and, uh, and, and, and mold, you know, mold yeah. on the walls and stuff. And, and, uh, and, and overgrown and broken windows and, and boarded up windows because nobody could afford to, to, to replace the window. And it was just, <laughs> but it was wonderful. It was absolutely yeah. wonderful. And also um, pastel colored houses. And these are these, originally they're beautiful houses, which have now been reverted to their original form by gutting them and redoing them. Oh. But therefore, Dick Mick and, and Lemmy were living in a squat in Labrador okay. Grove. Okay. And, uh, and one day, Dick Mick was in Hawkwind. Now, Dick Mick, very interesting character. Um, he bought himself a oscillator. And this is, I mean, you know, it's cast our minds back to the olden days <laughs> in the 20th oh, century. Yeah. Of course. And, uh, and, and there we are before synthesizers. Yes. And Dick Mick was the first person, as far as I know, in the world to start, start using these oscillators to get this space rock sound. And every, anybody who doesn't know Hawkwind, well worth discovering, of an course. amazing band. Of course. Um, and, and, and Hawkwind, therefore. Haul the Mountain Grill, man. Haul, Haul of the Mountain Grill. And Haul. of course, the Mountain Grill w was yeah. our local cafe. Oh, wow, so that's where it comes from. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, and it didn't have a hall. It just had a door straight into the cafe. Oh, off, wow. Off, it, it was on Portobello Road, which is our, our, our local market. Not a uh, long, long, long little road that goes all the way through that elaborate grove, Notting Hill Gate. Okay. And so, right. so, so the, mount, the Mountain Grill was in fact a, a greasy spoon yeah. where you bought your fish and chips and your saveloys and, and you know, and, and, and all the musicians used to meet there. Okay. So, 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 so all of the Mountain Grill sounds incredibly, you immediately have it in, in your mind, you think of these, these eerie castles in a strange space sci-fi land yes. of course it's, it's a greasy chip shop <laughs> so <laughs> oh, anyway man. so so, so, so um, dick mitzing Hawk, hawkwind has been there for a while and he's a speed freak and uh, so is lemmy yeah of course and uh, and they're they're both living together quite happily dealing a bit of speed and, and taking speed and, and lemmy's a rhythm guitarist yes he's not a bass player and uh, he was a rhythm guitarist in the rocking vickers in yes he was sam sam gapal etc Yep. All these other bands, and he was also one of Hendrix's roadies. In yes, Stanley, he was, which you yes, probably read about. Yes, um, and not a lot of people know this again. Michael Caine, um, <laughs> <not a lot, laughs> but he used to, Hendrix used to have him go and go and get his deals of of, of acid. Wow, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Lemmy was was Hen, was Hendrix's acid dealer, and uh, and Hend <laughs> you know, he'd, he'd, he'd go and pick up his acid for him, and uh, and therefore what would happen was was uh, Hendrix was a Hey, Lemmy, you want to go and pick up some acid for me? Because he's a real sweet guy, Hendrix. Sure. And, uh, and Lemmy goes, yeah, all right, how much do you want? He goes, oh, pick me up about eight or ten tabs. And he'd come back with eight or ten wow. tabs. And, and, and uh, Hendrix would, would swallow seven of them and insist that Lemmy took the other three immediately. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we're, talk we're talking about serious mind-blowing experience are oh, you experienced damn lovely yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i know that so so, yeah. so, so 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 lemmy had, had, wow. had been uh, been been you know seriously out of his box quite a lot anyway so so there you have dick mick and lemmy uh, in this elaborate grove squat and dick mick's off going going do the, doing these these gigs everywhere with hawkwind yeah, and course. at one point dick mick comes back and he says uh you know lemmy uh you need to you know come come along on the bus uh, we're missing a musician, come along on the bus. So Lemmy gets on the bus to go to this first gig with Hawkwind. And on the bus, um, they turn around and say, um, well, you're gonna be playing bass. Silence. Lemmy goes, well, I've only, I've only got me rhythm guitar, yeah. And, uh, and Del Detmar, who's one of the band, who's driving the bus, turns around and says, no, no problem, Lemmy, I've got a bass in the back, it's off now, whatever, you know. 
was 35 quid bass. <laughs> and <laughs> that, that's, that's how Lemmy started playing bass. Now, what's interesting about this, this long rambling story, is that Lemmy's bass style starts from this rhythm guitar attitude, yes, playing chords, yep. and then picking the chords. Yep. And then we flash across, if you will be so patient, dear listeners, dear friends, gals and guys, and we go across to Boris the Spider. Boris the Spider. Okay, with yeah. the bass sound on that. Dum, doodle, dum, doodle, dum, doodle, dum, dum. And you're talking about a fucking lead, oh, excuse me, beep, a lead <laughs> bass, a lead bass, okay? So therefore, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a lead guitar, lead bass style mixed with a rhythm guitar. And that's, that becomes Lemmy's style. That becomes Lemmy's hallmark, okay? Yeah. Um, therefore, Lemmy starts playing bass but yeah. in, a, in a strange and different way that most people don't do. Yes. Uh, apart, apart from the Ox, Entwistle, who's called, also called the Ox, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, John Entwistle, very tall man, um, brilliant. Um, a complete clothes fanatic, gotcha. again. A clothes fanatic. He, he spent all his money on buying clothes. Very strange. Wow. Anyway, so, so uh, and of course, you know, there, there we have it. Now, Lemmy and I have been hanging out together for a long time before he got kicked out of Hawkwind. And um, because I met Lemmy at the Speakeasy. Now, sure. the Speakeasy, the famous, world famous Speakeasy, um, was the club where all musicians went to. Gotcha. And, and uh, at the age of, the, the tender age, I, I started drumming at the age of nine, right? N nice. Uh, uh, and at nine years old, in one of the worst winters that Britain has ever known, um, in the snow, um, I go door to door in my, we're out in the suburbs in, in, um, in Chiswick, uh, which is near Hammersmith Odeon, in fact, funny enough. Oh, nice. And, um, and um, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, so, so, so uh, I've been plaguing my parents for a drum kit for like months with little signs hanging up all over the house saying, <laughs> I must have a drum kit. You remember, I need a drum kit. My birthday's coming soon. I need a drum kit. I must have a drum kit. And it, I'm plaguing it and pissing, pissing my parents and everybody off, you know. And we haven't got much money at the time. So they advanced my birthday from the Monday, 25th of February, to the Saturday so that I can enjoy what I'm getting as a, as a present. Yeah. And I really excited on that Saturday morning. I must have got up really early for the first time in my life, apart right. from staying up all night. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm a night bird. Yeah. I like to be up at night. Yeah, and um, and so I, I, I raced down the staircase in our, in our little house in Chiswick and, uh, and go into the dining room. And there on the dining room table is one box. I look at it and go, and I'm looking around the dining room, where's the rest of it, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, and so I open, you know, wrapping paper all over the table and stuff, you know, in a frenzy of a nine-year-old frenzy. Yeah. And I open it up and it's a lovely snare drum with a little stand and one tiny little splash symbol. The splash symbols are called splash because they go, pssst, Yeah, pssst. it's it's, it's a great, great sound. Great, yeah. I, I've got some uh, uh, over there. I don't know, can you, can, where are you? Uh, where are you? Uh, there's, there's my drum kit over here. Gotcha. Okay, I've, got, I've got this lovely Gretsch drum kit. Okay, how are you going to see this? If I... I need to see this. You need to see this, hang on. Let's okay. put some light on the subject. No worries. And therefore, now we're looking at me. Now you're looking at, there's the drum kit. See, that That looks very nice. All okay. the symbols look really nice on it. They're, they're Zildjans. They're beautiful. Yeah. And this is... There you go. That's a splash symbol. They're gotcha. all Zildjans, you see. Gotcha. It's a lovely, great, lovely, lovely Gretsch kit. Very gotcha. small kit, but, uh, but it's, it's great because this house is actually soundproofed. Nice. So, um, which is great, both for, both for drumming and, and for girlfriends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that, that's not too racy for you, is it? No, it's not. No good. <laughs> okay, well, because this is going to get a bit racy in, in various areas. So anyway, there we are. Me, in my dining room, open up the snare drum. I set up the snare drum with this tiny little stand and a little stand for, for the cymbal. And, uh, and I set it up. And, I, and so I race up back up the stairs and my father and mother are still in bed. And I go up to my father and say, thanks so much. This is real sweet. Um, where's the rest of it? <laughs> <laughs> My father, who's, who's kind of very dry, got these cold steel blue eyes and a rather frightening person, 
Yeah. He, he, he wears a monocle. He just lets the monocle drop. And he, his paper goes down. His monocle drops out of his eye and goes, if you're serious about it, you'll find a way. And pops his monocle back in. And, oh. And so they are, they are just like so pissed off with me that, that, you know, for months I've been plaguing them. We haven't got much money and that's all they could afford. So yeah. a snare drum is a good start. Yeah. So anyway, so, so you, if you, you know, if you're serious about this, you'll find a way. So quick as a flash into the old brain, I raced back down the stairs into the kitchen, opened the cupboard doors under the sink, the sink, you know, the, yeah. where the water is. Yep. And, uh, and grab what, we, well, we don't have rubber in those days or plastic. So, uh, I mean, we have rubber, but not, it's not a rubber bucket. So it's a no. metal bucket. Yeah. So I grab a big, big, big iron bucket. And, and, and sponges haven't arrived in Europe then either. Wow. So, so it's, like, it's like a rag, you know, like, like a dish, dishcloth yeah. and, some, and some soap. And off I go, put, put on some Wellington boots, which are these big rubber boots nice. um, over, over my pajamas and a pair of jeans over my pajamas and a woolly, uh, a woolly jumper and a woolly hat and yeah. nice warm coat and some gloves. Nice. And off I go into the snow. Bok, 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 can I wash your car, please? At the age of nine, right? And nice. they're all sort of look, looking around going, but it's snowing. You know? no. like, it doesn't, doesn't matter. I've got to earn some money. I've got to buy a drum kit, you know? Yeah. And, and, and so half of them, like, took, you know, they, they gave me a, a couple of pennies. Yeah. Um, and I said, I'll oh, go and get out of here. Um, you know, come, can, come back when there's no snow, you'll be able to wash the car then. Of course. So after about three or four cars and three or four neighbors, um, I have enough money to buy my first pair of drumsticks. Nice. So, I go back into the house completely drenched and, and with the one car I did wash, I, it's like cold water running down into my armpit. I will never forget that feeling, horrible. Oh, because car, car, cars were high in those days. Yeah. And plus you had the snow and, and I was very small. Yes. So, you know, a nine year old. And, and so anyway, cut a long story slightly shorter. Um, race back into the house, um, you know, by then it's like 10 o'clock in the morning. And I say, mum, we've got to go to King Street Music Stores. This is where, all the drummers go to buy their their kit and uh so off we go and the last client i've got uh says here son when you buy your first pair of drumsticks you make make sure you roll them up and down the counter to see if they're straight or not i go okay got it i don't know why but i'm going to do this right so, <laughs> so i've got I've, I've got the plan yeah and i've got these little piles of pennies in my hands right yeah and so off we go to King Street Music Stores and uh, we open the door and it goes bling, 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 one of the little bells, you know, little bells, so the door, door's opening. Of course. Bling, 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 bling. And we walk in and uh, to my right, there's a guy with long hair, long dark hair and a big nose. Of course. And on my left, not, not as long as yours, a bit shorter, but in those days it was long uh, because it was pre-hippie, remember? Of course. We're, 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 you know, we're, I'm nine, so, so, so it's like 62, 63. Okay, so it's before like Woodstock and all that stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, way okay. before that. Okay, oh, way, okay. way, way before. You okay. know, I mean, so, so anyways, this the guy with, a little guy, a bit taller than my, myself, uh, on my right, and then on my left is a slightly bigger guy with long, dark hair and, uh, and a big nose as well. And behind him seems to be a really, to me as a youngster, a really old guy, right? And anyway, so I'm rolling my sticks up and down the counter. I've got my little, uh, little piles of pennies. Yep. all lined up perfectly to yep. exactly the right amount of money and not one penny less Correct. and not one penny more <laughs> <'cause Okay. laughs> to, to buy my first pair of drumsticks. Okay. And these, these, these three geezers standing around me are sort of looking, looking at me sort of with a little smile on their face. They're looking at each other going, oh yeah, here, here goes another one. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another one on the sunken trail to misery. Oh and, no. Uh, no, no, in joke. You know, oh, okay. sense of, British, British sense of humour, come on. Gotcha, and, uh, gotcha. And, uh, and so, um, anyway, um, then uh, Mick and Keith turn up and take away the old geezer at the back. It's Charlie Watts. Okay. The, the drummer of Rolling Stones. And, uh, and then no Paul, McCartney and jo Paul, Paul, uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon turn up and take away Ringo, who's standing on my left. Whoa! And then Pete Townsend and the Ox, the bass player, turn up and take away Keith Moon, who's standing on my right. So there I am at the age of just 10. In fact, I'm actually nine, because it's a Saturday. I'm not even 10. And I'm standing in a room full of three of the most iconic drummers wow. of, the of the future. But at that point, they're still playing very small gigs. Wow. We're Charlie Watts has just joined the band. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 
we're, we're at a, 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 a real cusp point. Wow. So kind of, that kind of sealed my fate. Oh, that, that's nothing. <laughs> that's nothing. But anyway, so, so, so there we are. And we'll get back to Lemmy in a second. And so, so, um, so off I go. And for about two or three years, I spend a lot of time washing cars and finally managed to get, to get, get together this, uh, this higgledy-piggledy misshapen kit of different makes and different colors and all that. But I'm, I'm starting to drum. At the age of 13, I'm in blues bands. Uh, I'm still at the French, French school, the Lycée in London, oh. which was much less posh than it is now. Okay. And although we didn't have much money, they managed to scrabble enough money to pay for this, um, which wasn't that expensive relatively in those days. Okay. And, um, they wanted to have uh, little European kids um, that spoke another language, which I thought was a jolly good idea. Yeah. And, and didn't have a uniform either, so, so it's well cool. Right. Anyway, so, um, so, so there we are, your, your friend of mine, Lucas, who's, who's now drumming away. Um, and by about the age of 17, I finally finished, I managed to get out of the Lycée, having done all my exams earlier, one year earlier, because I can't stand being there anymore. Gotcha. And I just, I just want to get out there because uh, I really want to drum. And, um, and therefore, I start answering ads in the back of the Melody Maker, which is our equivalent of not Billboard, but one of those. You know, it's like a music mag. Gotcha. And, and at the back, there's, there's all these, uh, you know, um, looking for a drummer, no breadheads, no time wasters type ads. Of course. <laughs> and um, and so, so I'm replying to these and starting to go, go to auditions. And I'm getting all the ones I don't want, and I can't get the ones I do want. So I start realizing, ah, I'm going to have to break this circle. Gotcha. So I, I, for, for about three months, I replied to every single ad that was in the Melody Maker. Gotcha. And went religiously to all these, these auditions. And finally, I became hardened enough. Gotcha. I didn't give a flying proverbial um, to, uh, as to what, uh, you know, take me, on to, take me or leave me. This is what you got. Yeah. And I started, so I started getting, getting the, the drumming gigs I wanted. Yeah. So there I'm, there I'm just turned 18 and uh, in fact 17 and I go to the Speakeasy, this famous club, because I know that I, to, in order to get into this world, you know, a lot of people, you know, ask this question, how, how did you get into Motorhead? You're, you're pretty much an unknown drummer with yeah. a lot of experience. Yeah. Um, how did you get into Motorhead? And this is, this is the, basically, I went into the Speakeasy, lied about my age, because I never had a baby, baby face. So, so, so at the age of 12, I was already looking like an adult. Nice. Um, and used to go to the marquee and stuff. Okay. And see, um, oh, I saw everybody at the marquee. I saw John Mayles Blues Breakers with Eric Clapton and also with Jeff Beck and also with um, uh, the guy who joined the Stones replacing Brian Jones, whose name escapes me right, just right now. Wow. Uh, Mick, Mick, Mick Taylor. Um, I saw... Um, all, all the bands, the Yardbirds there. Oh, wow. With Keith, with Keith Relf and, 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 and Jimmy Page. That's uh, a I saw, uh, late, Later on, I saw Led Zeppelin there in front of 300 people. Wow. When Led when, Zeppelin were just coming about. Okay, so um, when they were like a club band before they blew up in popularity and whatnot? You got, yeah. Mm. Wow. Wow, man. That's such a trip to see bands like on the come up up like that, like just before yeah. they become like because because I'm I'm 23, so I look at not to be that guy, but I look at everything with the historical perspective. So when I hear stuff like this, it always blows my mind. It always, well, of course, just, you know, and every ba almost every band started off small. Yes, of course. This this is the thing one forgets, you know. Yeah. And this is this is the sort of down to earth Lucas approach to things. Is, is that uh, well, you meet you meet the same people on the way up as on the way down. Yeah. So you might you might as well be respectful and nice. Yeah, of course. Because you, you, that's just talking selfishly. Yeah. Apart from you, you need to be respectful and nice anyway. Yeah. Because that that's why I believe in living, you know. But but um, as a gentleman. So anyway, so 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 I lied about my age, got my membership card for the Speakeasy, and still having not much money, uh, in fact almost no money. Um, therefore, I'm I'm going to Speakeasy two or three nights a week, and drinking one half of beer. And making that last all night. Nice. <laughs> Until, um, yeah, well, nice, yes. <laughs> and but I'm starting to learn the lingo, you know, because suddenly in the '60s, in in the '60s, um, everything's changed. The um, the language has changed. The way of living has changed. Um, the way everyone's dressing completely different from each other. Um, the speakeasy, you know, you got Keith Moon standing on standing on a table with a bottle of bottle of cognac in his hand. You got 
Oliver Reed, the actor, standing next to him. In the corner, you got maybe Status Quo. In another corner, you got Thin Lizzy. Oh, uh, my sur God. Sur sur surrounded by girls. Um, you got all sorts of people coming in and out, Robert Plant, etc. Cetera, et cetera. This is a speakeasy of, 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 of the late 60s, early 70s. Wow. So this is the place you need to be if you can get in there. And I was lucky enough to, to bluff my way in there. And so this was, if you like, the, 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 the turning point, which meant that I could actually get into this world um, from my strange education in a French lycée, which had nothing to do with the music business. And, and also meant I was a bit of an odd one out because I was completely bilingual and bicultural. And the buy-in's there for the moment, but I'm yeah. never say never. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, I don't know about, of course, I could be bisexual as well, but I'm not. But, and I've got nothing against anybody no, who's LGBTQ, etc. cetera, no. all for it, you know. Yeah. Um, everybody needs to be able to do what they want to do. You know, of that's course. As far as I'm going. It's your own life, live it yep. to the full. This is not a rehearsal, we're only here once. Yes, exactly. Until, until you know, proven wrong and coming back as a, I don't know, as a frog or or a locust or something. Yeah, if reincarnation is your thing. But Ooh. yeah, so so you met, so so did you meet Lemmy at the speakeasy or? I met Lemmy at the speakeasy, okay. uh, like four or five years later. Okay, wow. Yeah, I, and I was already gigging a lot. And at the age of 20, I was in a strange little band called W.H. Pierce Band. Okay. W.H. Pierce Band was basically an R&B, rhythm and blues. Um, that's not R&B, like rap R&B. This is rhythm and blues like it was then, right? Okay. So it's, it's rhythm and blues. It's blues plus rhythm. So it becomes Yardbirds, Early okay. Led Zeppelin. All okay. of those bands were rhythm and blues bands. Okay. And, um, and so I've lost my thread just a second. Uh, so yeah, met, met, let me there. But, but at the age of 20, I was already in a band, W.H. Pierce Band. And we were looked after, we were under the wing of Pink Floyd. Wow. And, and, and they were lending us their, um, their prototype. Very interesting for, for those who are into this sort of stuff. For you geeks of, of equipment out there, these are the first Martin bass bins. Wow. Ma Ma Dave Martin became the worldwide, um, some of the best PAs and you know, sound systems in the world. Gotcha. And, and, and Pink Floyd had their prototypes. And then they started building these amazing um, PA systems. Gotcha. Um, because up until then, it, it was like what they're called WEM, and you had like a four by 10 inch speaker column, and you had hundreds of them to try right. and make up enough sound to, to combat the sound of the, the crowd and the, the, the volume. Because the Beatles couldn't hear, hear themselves on stage, and the crowd couldn't really hear them either. I saw the Beatles loads of times when I was like 12, 13. At gotcha. Hammersmith Odeon, amongst sure. others. Nice. I saw, the St I saw the Stones there loads of times. I saw I can Tina Turner there. I saw Ray Charles there. Stevie Wonder there. Wow. Uh, who else did I see at Hammersmith Odeon? Uh, Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis. Oh my God. All, 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 all the all the blue stuff. Um, you know, um, uh, including all the Fats Dominoes and people like that. Oh, it's great. Anybody who came to to Britain usually passed through Hammersmith Odeon, and nine times out of ten we went. Okay. At a very early, yeah, 12, 13, 14 yeah. years old. So, um, so back to WH Pierce Band with these bass pins and, and these, these PA stacks. We also had Allen and Heath um, mini console, like a 24 channel console, is one of the first miniaturized consoles. Great. Sure. And so, so we were kind of looked after by Pink Floyd's stuff. And we ended up being produced by Roger Waters and Nick Mason. Wow. So we spent, we spent a week at Nick Mason's house in okay. Islington, North London, okay. um, being produced by Roger Waters and Nick Mason. It was the week that Dark Side of the Moon went to the, to, to the top 10 in America. Wow. So um, they were suddenly overnight millionaires, you know? Yeah. Which band were you in at the time that they were recording? What was the band name? W.H. Pierce Band. Gotcha. I don't believe, okay. I don't believe any, any recordings exist. Now, funnily enough, there was a bass player called Dave Ambrose. Dave Ambrose is also a close mate of mine even now. Nice. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I'm in touch with a lot of people that I played with 40 years ago. And, um, and Dave Ambrose was a bass player in Brian August Trinity. For anybody who is fans of a wonderful series called Absolutely Fabulous, Okay, absolutely fabulous. 
has a, has a generic song, wheels on fire, rolling down the road, de, 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 this wheel shall explode. That's Brian Aldrich's Trinity. So he's in that okay. band, which was a big band at the time, worldwide hit. And he was also in Crazy World of Arthur Brown. Gotcha. Where his audition to get into Crazy World of Arthur Brown um, was Arthur Brown put him in, a, in another room, gave him a tab of acid, and waited 45 minutes for the acid to come in, kick in, yeah. and then said, all right, come in and play. If you get yeah. through this, you'll be in our bass player. Wow. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's crazy times, you know? This, this is the sort of thing that went on. Cause, that cause is, as far as that, a bit like Hawkwind took a lot of acid. Oh, see. of course. Well, I mean, I know like when they were writing music, like they were taking acid left and right, and well, Lemmy was a speed freak. He wasn't that much of an acid guy. That's exactly right. That, yeah. Hence, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, 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 yeah. The first time I, I met Lemmy um, was at the Speakeasy. Yeah. And um, and therefore, I, I got quite a lot of experience and was gigging quite a lot and, and doing a lot of studio sessions. Yeah. And he was obviously in Hawkwind and, and recording. I think I think the Hall of the Mountain Grill was what they recorded in '74. Yeah. In '74, I met Lemmy. Yes. And um, and so we were hanging out together, probably also because I had a car. And I was useful. He didn't drive. Oh, Therefore, yeah. it's much, much cheaper for him to have, a, have his own personal taxi driver. Of course. And um, so I was kind of 22 years old and he was 27, 28 or something. Of course. At the time, um, what were we in? 74. He was born in 45 or 44. 45, wasn't he? 45. It was. It, it was so, 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 so he was like uh, 29 or something, I suppose, at the time. Seven years older than me. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's about right. I was born in 53, so something like that. And um, you can see my maths is really hot, isn't it? <laughs> um, so, 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 so but, but we had the same obsessions. Um, we had the same musical taste. Um, and I can remember the first conversations we had. I mean, for a start, he had this wonderful sense of humour. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can tell this joke over here. It's a bit rude. No, I won't. So, so, so we won't take the risk. Um, okay. Anyway, so, so, so we had the same sort of stupid Monty Python style humour. Oh, you know, nice. It's, it's okay. Like okay. Fifth, n none of it's n none of it's Mr. Bean. I love Mr. Bean, but I yeah. prefer Blackadder. Yeah. Um, it's it's all sort of like fifth degree and stuff. Humour, like really wacky and out there. Yeah, know, of out, course. Off it's, off the wall. It's very outlandish, uh, outlandish left field type humour. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and uh, and uh, so so we had the same sense of humour. Um, musical taste. So um, the first night we spent together, the first time we met, we spent spent the night up all night on speed, and went oh. back to his went back to his place. Uh, I think it was the first night, might have been the second night. Um, I think it was the second. It was the second night. It was the night after. It gets the, a little the, hazy. The, uh, I, I, strangely enough, maybe I've got Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's old timers disease. <laughs> but I've got an incredibly clear imagery and memory of, of most of it. Okay. Obviously, there's massive patches that I can't remember at all. <laughs> I mean, how much can you remember of what you, you're like 23? Yeah. How much can you remember of what you were when you were 11? Yeah, of course. So it's, it's a sim, even, even a normal person is going to forget yeah. all sorts of blocks of memory. And memory is very, very selective as well, of course. Yes, it is. It is. So, um, so anyway, so... Um, I've got a very, very clear memory, and I'm, I'm writing my book at the moment, which is great fun, because it's the first time I, I'm actually plunging into my past, because I've always spent my life living going forward. Yes. I've, ne I've never actually thought about what happened behind, you know. Yes. So, so, um, so, so there we are uh, at the speakeasy, at the bar of speakeasy, and, um, and uh, we get to know each other really well, really fast, and we got the same. He also rode horses. I ride horses. Um, his father was a vicar vicar you know of the church oh okay 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 uh my grandfather was a vicar so we both had to put up with these sermons all the time okay. you know even even when, even when, when it wasn't in church we were being sermoned you know oh okay. you know you shouldn't do this and you should do that all that okay. stuff which okay. we hated yeah and so so we had that in common we had the second world war which i i studied um not in school but just like passionate very yeah. passionate i mean I was, I was only born eight years after the Second World War finished. Okay. Therefore, um, everywhere in London, where I was brought up, in the centre of London, before we moved to Chiswick, uh, and even in Chiswick, every single street had, had, a, had, had a bomb crater in it. Wow. Well, the Blitz, you know, we forget yeah, the, Blitz, the Blitz. The Blitz okay. in 1940. Yeah. Um, people were dying a thousand a night. Wow. 
and we had virtually uninterrupted for 60 days. Oh, yeah, that's of right. Blitz, of the Blitz, that's you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, so, that's so, right. so, so uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of people forget this. Yeah. But this, this is also explains something about British bands, but I'll go back to that in a minute, if you will. So, so there we are, Lemmy and I, obsessed by the Second World War and history in general, but mainly the Second World War. And also, we also have this thing where, um, how can you put this? There was so much hero worship. And this is, you know, psychologically a, a whole country which has stood alone. Right. Britain yeah. had stood alone against Nazi Germany and the whole of Europe had been invaded. Yes. And my mother was involved in, 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 in the, uh, in, in the, um, in the uh, Air Force. Yes. Um, and was on the base that sent all the, um, all the uh, resistance members to Europe. Gotcha. She was a com commandant of that base okay. at a very young age. Okay. And it was the most secret base in Britain. Gotcha. And, um, and so, so, so even she said, look, uh, you know, in 1940, we were convinced we were going to lose. However much Churchill was going, oh, well, no, we'll, we'll fight them on the beaches and all this. Quite right. Yes. But, but in your heart of hearts, you're going, well, our armies spread all over the world in these strange colonies that we still can't afford to have. Yes. And, and there's almost nobody at home. We've got the Navy, which is the most powerful Navy in the world. But again, that's stretched out all over yeah. the world to defend yeah. the colonies. Yes. And, and there's Hitler who's just on speed. Yes. Pervertine. Pervertine. The whole of, of Germany, Nazi Germany, was on pervertine. And it started with, with, with uh, the... Um, the Spanish Civil War, where they yes. tested pervertine on the pilots yeah. and on the tank commanders to make right. them be able to stay up all night and, and just keep, keep fighting. Yes. So, so how they invaded uh, Europe was also due to a drug called pervertine, which is gotcha. speed. Gotcha. Um, so um, both Lemmy and I are fascinated by this. And, and we've also been sermonized, sermonized to by her, his father, my grandfather, and also everybody around, it's just such a sense of relief that we hadn't lost. Yeah. Uh, you know, this hero thing becomes, you know, way over the top. And of course, you know, America came into the war, thank God, thank you for coming into the war. Of course. I've got to, I've got to admit it was a little late, <laughs> like in the First World War where yep. America came in in 1917. Yep, uh, American you know, isolationism. Before, yeah. I'm afraid, and, yeah. and, 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 and even then, you know, I mean, they only really came in because, uh, because of Pearl Harbor, you know? Yeah, yes. Um, even though um, Churchill's mother was American, yes. which also helped, you know, yeah. helped that, that uh, Roosevelt and Churchill got on well. Yes. But, um, but therefore, therefore, you know, you've got this situation, which, which is kind of a strange situation, where everywhere on all the TV channels, etc., it's, you know, how glorious we were, how wonderful we were, you know, and it just went on and on and on, year in, year out. Oh, here we go, another commemoration. It was just endless. Yes. It was just endless. And, and most of us kids and stuff who were very passionate about it in any way, and we knew a lot about it because we'd been so, so much, um, so much had been thrown at us. Yeah. You know, and the Nuremberg Tars and the terrible death camps and, you know, they're all, yeah. you know, the, the serious nasty stuff that went on. Yes. And, um, but, but there was also a kind of rejection. Um, a kind of rejection of um, this constant hero worship thing. Yes. Uh, and, and we started looking separately, Lemmy and I, were both separately when I was a kid and when he was a lot younger. He started looking at the opposition. Now, image, the image wise, and this is where I'm coming around to this, image wise, um, I was fascinated. Uh, I used to do you make model kits when you were a kid. I, I, I came across them, but I was always afraid of building them because I was like, I don't want to destroy anything. So I never actually built them. I would always look at them like, this is cool, but I would never actually build them because I was like, I, I don't want to mess anything up. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what, you can't make omelets without breaking eggs. <laughs> that's true. No, you're right. And, you're right. And, and, and in messing things up, that's how you get the great idea. That's true. No, you're right. You're right. You got you, you got to make mistakes in life to to advance. No, and, you're and right. And out of out of, out of out of those mistakes, you know, we'll come to the musical side of, of that particular argument as well because oh, it's yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah. That, 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 that it's it's not just copying the others that that, that that gets you to be an individual. No. It's all the mistakes you make which become your way of doing things. Like Lemmy. Yes. Rhythm, rhythm guitarist who turns bass player. Bassist. And it turns but, out to be one of the best bass players of all time. 
Uh huh. Well, I, word, I think but, so. I think yeah. so. Honestly, I'll be I'll be very honest with you. Let me to like like I play. I'm a bass player myself. I can never play with the. Oh, pick cool. to, I can never play with the pick to save my life. But in terms of bass tone, I think Lemmy has the greatest bass tone of all time. I don't care about anyone else's bass tone. I want Lemmy's bass tone. That Rickenbacker, Murder One, Marshall amp tone. I want that tone. Every time I get a pedal, I'm always like, how can I make this help my bass sound like Lemmy? You, you got a you got a Rickenbacker? I'm try. Don't have a Rickenbacker. The 401. Yeah, they're expensive. I need one. No, I need yeah. a. Re I need one. I like if I could get that, then it's done. I I, I can I can get the Lemmy tone like that. Uh, well, well, then, then you probably need to ch change the pickups on it, because 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 Lemmy, he was a humbucker uh, guy. He was a humbucker guy, absolutely, and yeah. and those humbuckers are great pickups. Oh yeah, so, they so, are. So, so and 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 also the the amps and and, and uh, Jim Marshall, who built the Marshall amps, yep, um, was was also a, a very in, like Dave Martin, was at the front line, and 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 Pete Townsend, who played high watt and. Uh, and all the bands at the time used to go and see Jim Marshall and Jim Marshall would say, well, what do you really need out of these amps? You know, and, and he'd build new amps all the time. Um, yeah. and it's constantly, constantly improving them. Yeah. And, and, you know, Lemmy's bass sound also comes from, from the technology yes, that, it does. That, 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 that was built into the, the, the amps and, uh, and what speakers and all, you know. Yes, of course. So, so that's the geek side of it. But, but um, so, 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 so there we are, you know, and I'm building these kits and, the Spitfires, are all, all, Spitfire was a, 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 a British plane, a very, very good British plane, but also a terrible killing machine. Of course, it's a fighter. Wow. It's a fighter aircraft. And, um, but it looks, it's all in curves. It's a beautiful looking, if, if you Google up a Spitfire, it's a beautiful looking air, aircraft. Gotcha. And, uh, and it looks really sweet. And it's Mer it has Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, which got wow. sound, sounds amazing. Um, and, and the camouflage. Was, was like green blobs and, and brown blobs, which imitated the countryside um, around the south of England at the time, you see. Gotcha. So it looked really safe and sweet and friendly gotcha. for a killing machine. Gotcha. On the other side, opposite the Spitfire, was the Messerschmitt 109, which is the German na Nazi aircraft, yeah. which looked really mean. And, yeah. and its, it, its wings were cut off square. Yes. Like like chisel chisel toe toe um, cowboy boots, you know, yeah, they were yeah. cut off square. The nose was cut off square, and in the nose was a cannon. Yes. Um, the camouflage, instead of being lovely sort of brown and green blobs, was like all this this strange. It looks like looks like a python or something. Gotcha. Not Monty Python, but like a python, the snake. Yes. And um, it's it's not a flying circus. And uh, <laughs> any. Uh, and, and, and anyway, and, and of course, the 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 um, the uh, all, all the imagery, um, the the black crosses, the swastikas. Yeah. Now, the iron please, cross. please, I, I will underline in red, and I'll do it several times. Lemmy and I were not Nazis. No, and have nothing course. to do with anything to do with Nazism okay. or the doctrine or anything that which I think is horrendous. Yes. Um, and, 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 and really needs to, you know, it needs to be looked at carefully because it's, it's, it's a very, very nasty way yeah. of thinking about human beings and life. Yes. It's not, it's not what I can prone at all. No. But, but we were anti-establishment. Yes. Hawkwin and Pink Fairies were two of the most anti-establishment bands around. Yes. At the time, at the time, um, no, I'll, I'll, let's just finish off on, on, the, on, on, the, on the imagery. Sure. Because there, on one side, I, I, and I'm buying all the books and, and really getting into it, and the SS divisions and, you know, the, the SS uniforms were designed by Hugo Boss, yep. the famous designer. Um, the Tiger Tank and the Panther Tank, which are two of the uh, most, most dangerous and, and beautifully built um, uh, German Nazi tanks um, were both built by um, Ferdinand Porsche, who did Porsche sports cars. Yes. Uh, yeah, right? Wow. And, and the imagery, um, all of that imagery is something that we both kind of went, this is looking really dangerous. I like the look of this. As opposed to um, the khaki uniforms of the Americans, the khaki uniforms of the British. It yeah. all looks like really safe and, 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 and nice. And, you know, it, it all looks like, you know, the round helmets. Look at, look at the German helmet. It's like all cut off square like that. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, the year after Motorhead, George Lucas got his designer to imitate the German helmet to do the Darth Vader helmet. Wow. Darth, Darth Vader's head is a German helmet. Wow, I did not know that. 
Yeah, oh. yeah. Well, when you look at it and you just compare that to a, to a First World War, Second World War German helmet, I will. you've got it. There it I, is. There I it will. is. It's just painted black like the SS. And he's all in black like the SS. Cool. So, so that, that is the epitome of evil. Yes. And this is, this is, again, this evil thing. It's a question of we were anti-establishment. The establishment had been so pompous about us winning, which I know was relief and all that. I fully understand it. And God knows, um, with my mother being in it, with my father being in India and stuff, um, during the war and stuff, God knows I was so for it. And as I say, every single street all over Britain had bomb craters. And as I started coming to France, you know, these towns were completely destroyed by the war. I mean, it was just a horrendous, horrendous situation. Right. And of course, the, the sheer cruelty of, of the Nazi troops was just horrendous. So, so anyway. So, so there you have a kind of beginning of what becomes the motorhead image. Yes. Which is this, both of us were obsessed with the Second World War and the imagery yes. of, of, of the other side, yes. because they were the other side. Yes. And because this would shock our parents, this would shock everyone. the establishment, everyone. Yeah. The idea was to shock. Yes. The use of skulls, um, the skulls, which I've got one somewhere here. There was a Tottenkopf, which is that. Yes. which is on, on the lapels here. Yes. Um, the, the Iron Cross, all of those things were, were images which were so horrendous to Europe yes. and the world yes. that they flashed up the worst memories. Yes. And th this was a deliberate um, antagonistic approach, which was then, of course, picked up by uh, so Vivian, West, Vivian, West, well, Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren, oh. picked up on all, on, on all the motorhead imagery. Okay. as anti-establishment. And that's only six months after Motorhead began. Wow, okay. Motorhead began in 75. Yes. Beginning of 76, we got the punk movement. Yes. Therefore, that On Parole album, which is here. <laughs> this On Parole album. Can you see this? Uh, do I, do? I see it. There you go. Oh, okay. Th th this, this, this album, which has just been re well, no more than re-released. It's a new version, gotcha. remastered and all, remastered, and some lots of bonus tracks on it. Nice. Um, with me on almost every track with nice. Filthy. Nice. Um, but we'll come back to that in a bit, if you like. Yes. But th therefore, this this Motorhead, this beginning of Motorhead, due to our obsessions due to Boris the Spider, due to the Lemmy bass sound, due to this Hawkwind approach, that Hawkwind were such a, they were kind of space rock hippie band. Okay. Right, right. Okay, in Labrock Grove, this seedy place with, with rundown squats and all the rest of it where we all lived. Gotcha. And therefore you've got, and I'm rambling, you, you asked me to ramble, didn't you? Yes. It's, but all, no. it's, all, it's, all, it's, it's all Vivek's fault, you see, he, he told me I could ramble. <laughs> So, so, so if I'm rambling too much, you can blame him. Hey, I like I, I, my listeners will enjoy it. Trust me, I'm enjoying I'm enjoying everything you're telling me right now. <laughs> it's Oops, just oh, you, you just you just slipped. Sorry, it's all good. Just ro no, rolling my rolling myself a cigarette. Hang it's on, all, it's all good. No, you but got me? yeah, but, yes, I do. But I'll I'll ask you this, like like so so obviously when you met Lemmy, you both you you, you like you two had a lot of agreements on just a lot of like you said you guys had so much stuff in common so i assume like when you picked him up from the airport after he was sacked from hawk when you both like lemmy was like let's make a band no he wasn't okay mm. not at all not okay. at all no lemmy was a car crash when i picked him up from the airport he was a complete and utter car crash yeah. he was completely effed up yeah. Beep. And, uh, and, and he, he was really destroyed. He was so upset. Okay. He couldn't believe that, that, that his band had sacked him. Wow. Bear in mind, Lemmy had everything going for him in Hawkwind. Yes, he did. Because bizarrely, um, he, by accident, he became the star of Hawkwind. Yeah. I mean, completely by accident. Silver Machine was recorded at the Roundhouse where we did our first gig as Motorhead. Yes. They were, out, they were all, including Lemmy, out of their brains on acid. <laughs> when they went into the studio to listen to the recording, they realized that Dave, uh, Bob Calvert, who was, a, who was singing Silver Machine in the live show, yes. they realized it really didn't cut it. So 
they, they went through all, every single member of Hawkwind tried to sing it, Silver Machine. Yeah. And finally, begrudg begrudgingly, they came around to Lemmy and said, uh, Lemmy, can you have a go, please? And Lemmy goes, well, all right, I'll have a go. Yeah. And, uh, and Lemmy gets up and sings it perfectly. <laughs> so so he became, this became the biggest hit that Hawkwind ever had. Yep. And so completely by accident, he becomes the star of Hawkwind. Wow. Now, bear in mind that he is living on another planet to Hawkwind. They're all taking acid, smoking dope all he's, day. He's wow. it's going up like prices at Christmas. <laughs> and, um, and you know that phrase, right? Out of yeah. Motorhead, the song. Yep. And he, he is completely in another land. Um, yep. He's got no responsibility for running a band. <laughs> he's got no responsibility for, for keeping the band going and keeping everybody happy in the band, all that stuff. He's got no responsibility for leading the band, but he's kind of the star. Therefore, he comes up and does Silver Machine and he's, all the girls are rallying around. Oh, people yeah. Want to, people want to interview him. Yeah. Therefore, the, the other members of the band who were in, there, in the band way before he was. Dave Brock, oh, Nick Turner and all those guys. Yep. A lot of jealousy going down. Wow. Of course, of course. So when he got kicked out, he got kicked out for carrying two grams of amphetamine sulfate rolled up in his sleeve, as he yep. always did, yep. um, in his jacket on the Canadian border, which was the worst border in the world for getting busted. Wow. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. They've, you know, the Canadians yeah. are very hard-assed hard about this. Y yes, and, they uh, are. Yes, they, they, are. They, have, they have good good security. Yes, they do. Ooh. Even to this very day. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. The mountains really cut it. Yeah. And, um, and so, so in the bus, and I have this from Doug Smith, who is Hawkins' manager, who became Motorhead's manager, who I'm in touch with all the time at the moment. Gotcha. For, on, for on parole, in fact. And, gotcha. um, and there they are in the bus. So picture this. They're in the bus, and they all turn around to Lemmy, who's sitting at the back of the bus, and say, Lemmy, you're not carrying anything, are you? Oh, no, I'm not carrying anything. It's all right. I'm clean. Sure enough, <laughs> he, gets he gets busted. Oh, now, it's been going on for months and months and months where we were hanging out together, where often they'd call me up, panic, at like four or five in the afternoon. Yeah, where's Lemmy? We haven't seen Lemmy. We can't find him. And of course, Lemmy and I had been up for like two nights or three nights in the road, and fi finally he's crashed. He's fallen asleep somewhere. Yeah. And they can't find him to go on tour. So you mix the jealousy, the fact that he lives in, a, in another time zone. Yeah. Um, the jealousy of he's become the star of the band, plus this, this speed thing. Yeah. And finally, we're at the Canadian border, and this is the final straw. Yeah. So he gets busted. He gets put in jail. Yeah. And they go off to, to, to continue the tour without him. Yeah. And the next morning, it turns out that amphetamine sulfate is not illegal in, 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 in Canada, only cocaine. They thought it was cocaine. Oh. And they, they, they can't bust him. <laughs> no. Unfortunately for them, they can't bust him. Yeah. So Lemmy comes out and they call up Nick Turner and say, listen, we're on, we're on the way to, to, to the sound check. Yeah. Um, you know, so we'll play the gig. You know, Lemmy will play the gig. Yeah. And so they turn up, do the sound check, play the gig as if everything's normal. He gets into the dressing room and he is sacked. Wow. And he is absolutely devastated. Now, he is devastated also because Lemmy was Lemmy and therefore... In his mind's eye, everything was fine. You know, the gigs were great. It was all going great. Yeah. They had an awful lot of success due, due to Silver Machine. Yeah. He was a key member of the band, all that yeah. stuff. There's no way he was going to get sacked. Yeah. So when I picked him up from the airport uh, two days later, yeah, two days later, because he, he did the gig on the... He, so he got locked up when they get, went into Canada. He did the gig next day. Uh... And then he was sacked, and then he jumped on the plane. Therefore, I'm, I picked him up from the airport. I think it was the 14th of May, 1975. Okay. At, at Heathrow Airport. Gotcha. Him, and um, picked him up, and he was absolutely devastated. He gotcha. couldn't believe what had happened to him. Gotcha. And he, he, he was obsessed by getting back into Hawkwind. Gotcha. Because Hawkwind was the biggest and best thing that had ever happened to him. Yes. But, but you know, as a roadie for Hendrix, okay. As yeah. a rocking Vickers, rhythm guitar is fine. Okay. Sam Guitar, yeah. rhythm guitar is fine. But never had this kind of a success. And also money. Yes. He was actually earning good money out of this because he'd, uh, he'd written a couple of tracks and, yep. and all that stuff. He started yep. publishing money as well yep. as his wages. Suddenly yep. he was, you know, he was a big in, 
a pig in proverbial. Yes. He, he, was, he was a happy man. He was a happy yes. camper. He was yes. a happy camper. Yeah, he was, and, he was doing good. He was doing great. And, and, and all the girls and all the rest of it, he loved the fact that he could just, he didn't have to really, they didn't rehearse a lot. They just get on stage and jam away a bit Grateful Dead style. Yeah. And they had, they had their tracks that they'd play. Yes. But, you know, it was like, uh, I don't know, a 10 minute track with a 25 minute guitar solo. Wow. <laughs> that's true. No, that's true. I mean, seeing Hawkwind back in the day, must, no pun intended, that must have been a trip. Oh. It, it, don't, don't worry. It's just my, my um, hang on. Okay, no worries. It was, no it was worries. just my daughter, my daughter coming in. You back? Okay. Okay. Um, so, so, so there we are, and uh, I pick him up from the airport, and we go back to his flat, and he didn't want to see at, he didn't want to see anybody. Wow. Apart from yours truly, because I, I'm not this big macho man, no. um, and I I've hung out with a lot of <clears throat> alpha silverback males. Gotcha. And I don't need to com compete with people. No. Because I'm su such an ovni. I'm such a <coughs> I'm from my own outer space. Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm, you know, it's like that King song. I'm not like everybody else. No, and I'm course. not, I'm not, I can't, I mean, everybody's different, but you know, our thumbprint, everybody's got a different thumbprint, right? Yep. We're, we're all different, but I'm by the nature of, I was, I was very handicapped as a child. Uh, I spoke French, uh, you know, all these things mean that I'm very different Yes. <coughs> from your average rock and roller. Yes. And, um, so, so, so Lemmy and I, again, hung out very oh. easily together, very okay. comfortably, comfortably, comfortably together. Oh. I wasn't threatening him. I wasn't constantly getting up his nose, um, all, all of that sort of stuff. So, um, so for two and a half, three weeks, he didn't see anybody um, and was really pissed off. He was very depressed. Gotcha. And, and he'd go in and pick up his cash wages on the Friday to Doug Smith. Sure. Who was the manager? Sure. And uh, and I finally got pissed off with all this, and I said, "Look, Lemmy, this this is enough. You know, I've had enough of you being depressed. I've been through a lot of crap in my life, and um, and I always get up and you know start fighting again. Of course. And 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 he he, he sort of oh, you know I just want to you know just want to join Hawk, and I said I don't think it's going to happen. Gotcha. I don't think they're going to have you back. And I explained gotcha. why the stuff I told him, and I said I, I just can't see it happening. Um, listen, I'm a drummer. I've got quite a lot of experience. I may not be famous, but you've got this massive following. And you're yeah. a bass player. Let's do something. Hell yeah. Right, let's, let's, just, let's just get a band together. Now, unbeknownst to me, Doug Smith every Friday when he picks up his wages is going, Lemmy, they're not going to take you back. Form your own band. Well, why don't I just join another band? You know, is that no, no, listen, you've got the golden opportunity. You've got a big fan base. You've got a big following out there form your own band hell yeah so, so lemmy and i suddenly are in this situation where lemmy finally comes around to it and goes okay Lucas, okay lou you the only person in, in in my life who'd ever called me lou and okay lou let's do it right and we go back to all these i suppose hundreds of nights we've spent together yeah um where we we'd listen to mc5 we'd listen to the stooges We'd listen to Link Ray. We'd listen to um, Flaming Groovies. We'd listen to early Beatles tracks. Um, a lot of the nights, um, he'd grab an acoustic guitar and he and I would sing Beatles songs from the early period Beatles. Nice. Uh, which, were, which are very complex. Yes. Believe it or not, the actual yeah. chords they used, because they were so bored, because they were playing in Hamburg, Right? Yes. I mean, the, the, the Beatles, everyone think of the Beatles as like this sweet pop band. Yes. Uh, excuse me. They were tough Liverpool kids. Yes, they were. They were you know, one third of Liverpool was, was destroyed in the war. One third yes. of Liverpool was yes. wiped out. Yes. They, they, they came from a re very rough area. Yes. Uh, if you look at the photos of the Beatles when they're in Hamburg, they're, 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 they're four greasers. Yes. They've got their hair greased back. They've got leather jackets. They've got winkle picker toes, yes. uh, winkle picker uh, boots. Um, they're wearing, you know, skin tight jeans. Um, you know, they're a rocking, you know, they're rockers. Yes. They're, they're... They, they aren't no sweet pop band. No. And in, inter interesting enough, Brian Epstein, when he discovered the Beatles, they've been, they've been in Hamburg, I think, three times in the three years running. Yeah. And, and they were playing to... Ex, -sub ex u ex u boat cruise gotcha. in Hamburg, which was a, a U-boat base. 
gotcha. that therefore, you know, washed up in Hamburg, you got all these ex-Nazi um, sailors. Gotcha. Te on pervertine, on speed. The Beatles took speed at the time too, pervertine. Gotcha. The, Be the Beatles were living in a, in a the, where, they were, where they were sleeping when they got to sleep was in a porno cinema behind the screen. And it was a 24-hour non-stop porno cinema. Wow. They were, they were sleeping behind the screen with porno going on constantly. Wow. Uh, I mean, you're, you're talking about a really rough time, right? Jeez, this is Hamburg. Man. Hamburg is one of the roughest places with Glasgow in the world. It's a really rough place. Wow. So, so, so picture that. They're playing five sets a night. Five sets of like 45 minutes to an hour sets a night. Yeah. Some, something like 400 songs. Yeah. And they've played them so many thousands of times that now they're reinventing all the chords to make it interesting. Yeah. Hence, it becomes this really rich sound. And they're perfecting, perfecting their vocals for the same thing. Because at the beginning, it was the usual thing of one lead vocalist yep. and, 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 and you know, bringing on the chorus, maybe one, maybe two others to sing back up. Yeah, vocals. Yeah. But no, suddenly they're singing all three of them at the same time. They're, they're really, they crafted their sound out of this repression and suffering that they had in Hamburg. Yeah. Brian Epstein therefore hires a young, very young publicist who I think was 18 at the time called Andrew Lug Oldham. Gotcha. And this Andrew Lug Oldham and Brian Epstein have to clean up the Beatles because otherwise no record company will sign them. Gotcha. They look too dirty, too nasty. Yeah. And they sound too dirty, too nasty. But the crowds love them because they sound great. Yes. So it's, they are a real killing unit. They sound great. They're yeah. really, really, you know, re un unforgiving, beautiful band. Yes. Really kick proverbial. Yes. And, and Andrew Lou Goldham goes on from being their publicist where they cleaned up their image, gave him the Beatle haircut instead yes. of the grease back, yes. um, put them in identical suits yes. with, with, the, with, with the, the Mao, Mao Zedong collar. Yes. Um, the Beatle boots, which are classic, great Chelsea boots with, with the elastics on the side with winkle pickers. Yes. And, and so, suddenly they got this really, really cool image, but nothing like what they really were. No. The okay. Beatles, the Beatles were tough. The Beatles were tough as nails. But like, so, so, so obviously going, going back to the founding part of Motorhead. So with you and Lemmy, so Lemmy, so Lemmy talks to you and says, so they're just like, Lou, let's start a band. And you were just like, all right. No, um, it was more like you, you were in, you were, you were in. Finally. Oh. Yeah. Finally. Thank you. Finally. Hell yeah. Now, what I, also what changed it, which is actually a le legendary story, was, was um, in the last of those three weeks, Lemmy took revenge on Hawkwind. Oh! Have you heard this, have you heard this one? No, I have not. He, man he managed to, uh, to sleep with four of the Hawkwind's wives while Hawkwind was still on tour. Because he was absolutely charming and very, very persuasive. That's amazing. And, uh, and, and, and after that, he felt a lot better. Oh, I, so, so, I, I bet. So, so I think that was also part of the reason why he, he finally gave in and went, all right, Doug, all right, Luke, let's do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Then, of course, we come to the bastard story. Yes. Where, um, so we, we got the image coming together because L Lemmy at the time, if you look at the photos of Hawkwind, Lemmy's like wearing a, 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 a beige suede fringe jacket yes um loon pants um yes. you know um sneakers uh, yes. <laughs> uh tie-dye t-shirts you know yes. stuff like that awkward yes. t-shirts and stuff like, you know looking like the hippie like they all did yes and and so so suddenly we're i mean i already had my black leather jacket um and and he gave me a pair of white cow cowboy boots which you can see in some of the first pictures of me and lemmy because yes. in fact uh, ian dixon did the first photo shoot around that period. Gotcha. Just at the cusp, just when Lemmy, Lemmy and I formed this band. Gotcha. Um, there's a great photo shoot where you see me and Lemmy on our own. Gotcha. Where Lemmy's wearing a, 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 white, a black t-shirt with a white skull on it. You'll be able to recognize it immediately. Gotcha. And you'll see that I'm wearing a pair of white cowboy boots that he gave me because he didn't like my shoes. Interesting. So, so, so 
so so what yeah yeah because i had these great shoes which i had made at the chelsea cobbler gotcha. um and 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 they had sort of reasonable size heels like which gotcha. were very cool at the time gotcha. and they were racing racing green like british racing green in color gotcha. with 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 pants with a, with a panther collar and a zip down the front so gotcha. he hated he hated them he thought they were very uncool i, I thought they were great <laughs> they, they, they were great shoes and really comfortable. They were made at Chelsea Cobbler. They were really good shoes. Anyway, so, so, so one day he gets into my car and, and he, he gets this, 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 this brown paper bag and gives it to me. I said, gotcha. what's this? And I open it and this, this serious smell comes out of the bag. It's, it's really bad feet smell. Oh. And, 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 it's, and yeah, because Lemmy being up all night, you, you must remember being up all night. Just, just picture this, you know, um, when you're up all night for three nights in a row, you don't get undressed and shower. No. No. You no. just keep going. Yeah. You so have so to. when you when you finally take your boots off and you do this three or four times a week. They're not gonna smell months good. in, months out. It's they are seriously rotting flesh smell. Wow. <laughs> anyway anyway, so this being Lem and Lem being my, my, my favorite uncle and all the rest of it, I, I you know, throw my my my, my lovely shoes into the back of my van yeah pull it pull on the cowboy boots and there you have the shot so there we have the beginnings of motorhead um suddenly we're going down the portobello market which is our local market in nottingham gate in labrick grove the famous right. portobello market right. where you have that jamie roberts and hugh grant film called notting hill yes. you can see the whole of the market then um and there's memorabilia shops so we're starting to pick up memorabilia, uh, iron crosses, um, the, the, the Tottenkopf, the, the skull badges, because skulls weren't used anywhere in the rock and roll thing, apart from Great for Dead, and yeah. that is one of their logos, yeah. and apart from the Hells Angels. Yeah. Apart from that, skulls weren't used. I already had a little skull, silver skull earring, little one, yeah. on, hanging from my ear. And this skull thing became part of the, the whole this is a skull I actually made. In fact, I bought this plastic skull. And it's got little wheels on it and a key. You can see that key, you wind it up yes, and it, it roars is. around going Ehh. Nice. Like that. Nice. And which, which made, made Lemmy laugh a lot. But I spent one speed night actually making this skull look really mean and nasty because it was white originally. It was a white, r rather good looking skull. Gotcha. And now it looks like really mean and nasty. And yeah. two other, other them, and like those kits, I, I, I painted them like, like they were, it was little tanks. Gotcha. You know, we, 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 with the, the, the black cross on the side and, gotcha, gotcha. and sort of destroyed a few teeth and gotcha. oh, that's great. So, so, so um, and also, if I can find it just here somewhere, another bit of memorabilia. Um, I pick up two blank um, armbands, gotcha. SS, SS armbands. Gotcha, okay. And I get, I get my Latvian girlfriend and her girlfriend at the time to embroider Oh, that is sick. That is awesome. The Motorhead logo. Which we used to wear on our leather jacket here. Just like the SS divisions. So it's like that. Gotcha. Oh, wow. Okay. 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 Yeah. So, so another bit of memorabilia for you. That and, is so um, cool. And so, so the imagery started kicking in. And uh, Lemmy loved mirror shades. So we had mirror shades. Cowboy bitch, I'd already got mine. He'd already got his. Yeah. Uh, iron crosses, other parts of regalia on, on the jackets as a, again, anti-establishment shocking thing to do. Yes. You know, and, uh, and of course, the music started coming together and we have to start looking for guitarists. Of course. So at that point, we look at lists of different guitarists that we're starting to make. And um, in fact, before the guitarists, there's a thing about, you, you know, everybody knows this logo. Of course. Right. Where are the two little dots? The umlaut, it's on the second O. Right. Lemmy and I had a row, a running row for three days about the umlaut. Really? Three days. Three days. Uh, Lou, it needs to be on the first O. No, it's got to be on the second O, Lemmy. No, it's got to be on the first O. No, it's got to be on the second, Lemmy. I said, listen, Lemmy, I did seven years of German at the Lycee. Seven years of German, you know, ich, ich spreche Deutsch. Wow. Okay? If, you, if you want the whole of the Germanic world to mispronounce Motorhead, they're going to go, 
motor head. Yeah. Not motor head. Yes. And he went, oh, no, no, it looks better on the first one, man. I said, no, that's enough. And I got a piece of paper and a pen, because at art school, I did six months of art school, foundation no. course, and no. I did calligraphy there, no. including Gothic script. Nice. So I'm so pissed off, I finally just get out a piece of paper, and I, I, I write down in Gothic script, Motorhead. And apparently this is the first time that Motorhead had ever been written in Gothic. Nice. And I put the, the umlauts on the second O as it should be. And I pushed the paper across the, the table. He just looked at it and just laughed and went, all right, Lou, you got it. Nice. <laughs> second O, second O. Nice. So we've now got the image falling together. The, the music, um, as I said earlier, um, 73, 1973, two years before Motorhead, nice. one year before we met. Does the oil petrol crisis, does the, 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 the petrol crash, gas, gas crash, okay. petrol, oil crisis worldwide? Yeah. Yes. And uh, the, the, the price of vinyl doubled because vinyl is made from petrol. Oh, it or not. okay. Um, massive unemployment for the first time since the war in Britain. Okay. And so a lot of kids, a hell of a lot of kids are broke, can't afford anything. They're on the dole, that's uh, social security, whatever it is, you know, okay. when you're unem unemployed, you get paid okay. A, a, okay. a miserable amount of money, but enough okay. to just, just about not live on. Okay. Uh, just about enough to buy your bag of speed or whatever, and not eat. <laughs> okay. and, um, and the bands at the time, you got Genesis, Yes, Hawkin, Pink Fairies, etc. But Genesis, Yes, the Stones, the Beatles, everybody, they're living in manors outside. Little, little castles outside London. Yeah. <clears throat> they're, they're driving Rolls Royces. They're, they're multimillionaires. Yes. <coughs> Pink Floyd, all that stuff. Yes. Led Zeppelin, they're all multimillionaires. Yes. Yes. And the disconnect between okay. the kids and them is massive. Okay. They're also playing, as I said earlier, like 10 minute songs with 25 minute guitar solos. Yes. Drum solos and all that stuff. Yes. And, and the kids need something different because they are violently angry with what the establishment has done to them. Yes. <coughs> what was promised by the hippie ethic wasn't delivered. Yes. So they needed something new. A lot of things changed um, yes. in, in our lives, but not enough. Yes. And they needed, they needed something new. They needed yes. something fresh. They needed something they could hang their hat on and something they could call their band. Yes. This was what Motorhead was. There was nothing like Motorhead at yes. the time. Yes. Yes. In, in Europe, anyway. Yeah. And, uh, and in the States. Yes. No, the, trust... MC5, the MC5 weren't that famous at the time. No, they were not. No, they were not. They, it was unfortunate, actually. A lot, of that, a lot of that Detroit rock and roll was never that famous. Absolutely right. And, and in fact, yeah. MC5, MC5 got kicked off their label. Yes, they did. For because, believing. Because, for, for, for singing the intro. To, yeah, to pick, kick out, out the jams. They kick out the jams. They, they believed in it, and the label's like, nope, we're taking you off the distribution. Uh, and, you know what they, and you know what they did as soon as the label forbade them to do it? They, they took they, out a full-page ad in the local paper. You know this one. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and they put the label's name on it. Yep. As if the label were behind it. And yep. that's when they got kicked up, kicked yep. off the label. Yep. They, they, in fact, apparently um, suggested that the label should sign, I think it was the Doors. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, so, so yeah, so history. Anyway, so, so, so there, there we've got Lemmy and I, who are obsessed by um, short, sharp shock songs. Flaming Cruises, okay. Um, okay. Uh, Stooges, early, gotcha. really okay. early Stooges, okay. kind, of, kind of garage rock trash. Yeah, like this fast, yeah. fast, 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 fast. Yeah, and so of like course, the stuff that sort of predated that paved the way for punk rock, the original style of punk rock, at least the way I know it. You know, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, somebody asked me the other day. I said, "Well, if if just imagine, Lucas, <clears throat> that you'd stayed in the band." How would you see the first version of Motorhead um, shaping up in 76? The first version, yeah. not with Filthy and Eddie. Yeah. But the first version, this one, the, the on parole version. This, yeah. this, 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 this first, if that had been released at the time 
and, and we'd have gone, gone, gone ahead. How would you see it fitting in with what was happening? I said, perfectly. Listen, my close mate, Brian James of The Damned, guitarist of The Damned, right? Neat, 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 New Rose, the first punk singles. Yep. Um, another mate, Tony James of Generation X, then Zig Zig Sputnik, then Sister wow. Mercy. Right? Yeah. Um, and all these, these, these punk bands yeah. saw three bands as their favorite bands. Initially, it was Hawkwind and Pink Fairies because of their attitude. Yes. More than because of the music. Yes. Um, although, you know, it was you know, a serious big experience when you went to see them. Yes. Um, but Motorhead. Motorhead. It was getting up on stage and really going for it. Yes. And much louder than anybody, had, you know, it was the loudest band in Britain. Everyone said it was the loudest band in the world. It might have been, I don't know. No, they were. Extremely lucky, were extremely lucky. Uh, I, I made a stupid joke before we came on air about uh, this is called Death Wave. Yes. And I misheard you and said, Death, Death Wave? Death Wave. <laughs> Death Wave. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I was really lucky. I mean, if you like, the funny thing about this, again, the Michael, the Michael Caine job, um, not a lot of people know this. The uh, funny thing about this is that um, if you get off air and, and talk to somebody and say, I've just been speaking to Lucas Fox and Melody, the first question I'll ask you is, is he still alive? Yeah. And when, and when you go, yeah, and they'll go, is he deaf? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were, be, be, they, because of the sound that it was so loud yes it was way before sound db restrictions came in and stuff like that yeah. it was extremely loud yeah and so, so so i made sure in my infinite wisdom as, as a small 22 year old to make sure that the amps were always lined up with my drum kit either side gotcha. and never behind gotcha. and never in front so that way you They're, weren't masked over I, I, I wasn't being, um, being completely overwhelmed by that sound and I didn't go deaf. Yeah. Wow. So, so the secret is keep them per perfectly aligned with you. Okay. Well, yeah, because, because um, again, uh, people forget that the, 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 um, the speakers kick an awful lot, a lot out backwards yeah. as, well as, front, as well as frontwards. Yeah. You're standing behind the speaker. You can still damage your ears yes. with feedback and stuff. Yes, of if course. you're standing in front of the speaker, of course you can. Yes. Right. So, so, um, so there we are, and, and we start looking for guitarists. An obvious choice is Larry from the Pink Fairies. And gotcha. Larry from the Pink Fairies, of course. Um, Hawkwind and Pink Fairies have, have been on the same bill loads and loads of times in these hippie festivals and alternative festivals, anti-establishment festivals, even the Isle of Wight festival before Lemmy was in the band gotcha. uh, in 1969, I think it was. Gotcha. Uh, they, they, they played outside the festival. Gotcha. As an alternative festival, they tried to set up a free festival gotcha. uh, in, in competition with it and stuff like this. They had this, this ethic, anti-establishment ethic. Therefore, anything that was close to establishment, they didn't want. Gotcha. Hence, you know, hence the attitude came from the Hawk and Pink Fairies. So Larry seemed an obvious. Also, Larry had a great sense of humour, a really stupid, wonderful, snidey sense of humour. He, he was like a, a South London Alice Cooper as a singer. Gotcha. I love his voice. I love his voice. Gotcha. And, um, and in fact, do you, know, you know the Pink Fairies as well, don't you? Yes, of course. And, and you know the album that I recorded with them. Which, well, remind me, what, what was it again? Okay, it's called Resident Reptiles, and I've got it here somewhere. Gotcha. There you go. School me on. Uh, uh, where are we? There we are. Oh, I see. Yes, I do. I do. I see the. I see the cover. Okay, that's Resident Reptiles, with Paul Rudolph. Nice. Who? Uh, Paul Rudolph, who's a guitarist and singer. Yes. Alan Davy and me. Nice. Now. I'm on Facebook, as a lot of us are on too much of the time. Yep. And uh, I'm taking to taking to the kitchen to so grab another beer. <laughs> and um, so, so I'm uh, I'm on Facebook, as a lot of us are. Yes. And uh, and uh, comes on Facebook, little message saying, "Does anybody know how to get hold of Lucas Fox?" And me being me, I go, "Who is it? Who wants to know?" Hang yeah. on, so I'll just put you down. You can still see me. There we go. And, uh, and I go, who is it? And he goes, yes. Cleopatra Records, Los Angeles. Yes. Um, would you like to come and play on a Pink Fairies album? And I go, 
depends who's in the band. <laughs> and they go, Paul Rudolph, Alan Davy. Yeah. Go, yeah, I'd do it. Love it. Because Paul Rudolph, first guitarist of the Pink Fairies, wonderful Canadian, lovely yes. guy. Yes. Really lovely guy and incredibly talented. He, he did four, four Brian Eno albums. Yes, he did. Right? Um, and, and funny enough, Paul Rudolph lived with a guy called John Walker. Okay. For, for seven years, round the corner from where I was living. Okay. And John Walker becomes the rhythm guitarist of the Warsaw Pact. Wow. So Paul Rudolph have got, and I have got that in common. Okay. Paul, Paul Rudolph, when Lemmy was kicked out of Hawkwind, uh, Doug Smith called up Paul Rudolph to replace Lemmy. Okay. For that tour. So okay. Paul Rudolph was not only with my close mate, John Walker, Johnny like, Walker. Yes. But, but he was also the replacement of Lemmy in, in Hawkwind. Wow, that's insane. Alan Davy spent 20 years in Hawkwind. Yes, he did. Right? And Alan Davy was, was Lemmy's um, protege. Okay. Really funny little story about Alan. He, he went to a, 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 he'd been to lots of Motorhead and Hawkwind gigs. Yes. And, uh, and he was funny enough at the same age as when I met Lemmy. Uh, in yes. fact, when I was 21, when I met Lemmy, 22 was when we started my day. Yes. But uh, Alan Davy was 22, a young 22 year old who played bass. Yes. Rickenbacker, all the, all the stuff. And he walked up to Lemmy after a gig with his, with his bass case with him and said, uh, yeah, Lemmy, uh, I can play all the stuff you play. Yes. And Lemmy goes, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and, and he goes, no, no, I can, I can. I can play every single thing you've played. And Lemmy goes, this is a weird kind of fan. <laughs> and, uh, and he goes, all right. And he challenges it to him. He goes, all right, plug into my amplifier over there. All right, plug in, plug in, let, let me see it. 45 minutes later, Alan has been through loads and loads of stuff. And he's got exactly the same stuff as Lemmy, but right. he's got his own way of doing it. Yes. And it's beaut beautifully played. It's not just a copy. Because it wasn't just a fan going, I can play like Lemmy. He'd actually brought something to it. He was spitting out his own version of Lemmy as well. Yes. And Lem Lemmy teared up. He was, he was like really emotional about this. Yeah. He thought, well, I was about to swear again. <laughs> but uh, he, was really, he was really emotional. He thought, this, this guy is so obsessed with what I've been doing for all these years. Yeah. That he's actually gone out and, and you know, and worked out how, to, how I do it. Yeah. And nobody done that. Nobody done that at the time. Now there are a lot of great Motorhead tribute bands who, who can you know, do it pretty well. Oh yeah, I, play, I, I played one in, uh, with one in, in Athens recently, but I'll go to, go back to that in my ramblings in a little while. Of course. And um, oh man, the amount of bands that Motorhead inspired after they hit they hit music. I mean, goodness, it doesn't even matter what style of what your costume is. You could be a punk, you could be a metalhead, you could be a rocker. There's like there's always some element of motorhead to be found in those three styles of music i mean well you're absolutely right you and, know and like, again uh, people ask about you know how would how would motorhead have fitted in with the dams the sex pistols generation they would have, x you know, they, they easily fit in and they all those bands said that the reason why they decided to form a band was because they'd seen motorhead yes i mean because I, uh, you know, he was getting on stage and doing it rough and ready yeah, just really, really going for it. Yes, in a, in a violent way, which of course was punk. So, so this album, that first version of Motorhead, the first band, that first sixteen date tour, yeah, which cha changed a lot of people. This yeah. album is the is the bridge between progressive rock and punk. Yes, which then, of course, becomes heavy metal, death metal, thrash metal, blah, 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 all the rest of it. Yes. Um, including obviously Dave Grohl, Nirvana, you know, all yeah. grunge. Yeah. Oh God, grunge! What a wonderful thing grunge was. Pearl oh, Jam. Trust me, you know, I, I, mean, know. Uh, I mean, seriously, you know, and, yeah. and such lovely people as well. I got yes. to hang out with with, with, with some of them. Yeah, um, we had some funny times together when they were touring in Paris, you know, over in Paris and stuff. Yeah. So, 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 <clears throat> so, so here we are. We got, we got. Uh, Larry turns up. Larry Wallace, and then he got, well, Lucas Fox, man, good to see you, haven't seen you. And he had this really whiny voice, right? Yeah. But it's an un, 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 unreal sense of humor. Yeah. So we laughed a lot. Yes. And, uh, and so Larry came, grabbed, jumped in a taxi and came down the rehearsal studio. Yes. 
and the, the, the roadies had set up my kit and Lemmy's base stack and a stack for Le Larry. Yep. And, um, and uh, basically, Lemmy cut out three very long lines. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and Larry didn't even know, know what it was. He said, what's, what's that, Lemmy? He said, it's speed. Oh, God. Take it, take it. Take and and the they, were very, they were very long lines. So we woofed these speeds up, mm. this speed up our nostrils. Yep. Turn, turn the, they turned their amps up to 11, spinal tap side, yep. style, yep. and off we went, and it began. Yeah. Now, at the same time, Lemmy and, I, Lemmy and I actually wanted two guitarists in the band. Yes. We, we actually wanted a double guitar thing, because okay. we'd seen that work in, in several bands. We really wanted, and and we, we both wanted a guy called Ariel Bender. Yep. Who was in Mott the Hoople. Okay. And, okay. and he was the guitar player, right, if I'm not mistaken? Mm. Okay. Of Mott, the, right. of Mott the Hoople. Okay, okay. I just wanted, I just wanted a little bit of clarifying, that's all. Absolutely. And, and Ariel, Ariel Bender, his real name was Luther Grosvenor. Wow. So the original idea was Lemmy, Lucas, Larry, Luther. Wow. All Which L's. strange, yeah, all the L's. It sounded kind L's. of strangely perfect. Yeah. It, it, it's, it felt like everything was falling into place. Yeah. Anyway, after two or three days, Luther called us up and, uh, and told Lemmy, no, he's going to form his own band called Widowmaker. Okay. So the rest, is, the rest is history. But that was the original idea. Okay. And, um, and then this 16-day tour is booked, and we did a few rehearsals, not that many, and started playing um, tracks that Pink Fairies had done and Hawkwind had done, plus a bunch of favorite tracks that we had, Lemmy and I <coughs> in particular, yes. such as uh, uh, Lost Johnny and Waiting for the Man um, from Velvet Underground. I actually wanted to do White Light, White Heat, which I think is a great track. You know, that, that White is. Light, ba -da 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 White Heat, heat. Ba -da -da -da. great track. Oh, of course. I thought, uh, I, I thought that, you know, us, us in Motorhead, our new sound, would really, really kill that track. It'd be great. Yes. Anyway, so, so off, you know, once we'd done these rehearsals, the first gig is at the Roundhouse, the yes. famous, wonderful Roundhouse. Yes. Uh, where, where Hawkwind had played a lot, and I'd seen Hawkwind a lot there, and where yeah. they'd recorded, you know, Silver Machine and what stuff. Of course. And, um, and there we are at the Roundhouse, we're walking on the stage of the Roundhouse, and... Um, I look in the audience, and the audience is full of uh, ex hippies, um, Pink Fairies fans. It's like completely riddled. It's, it's compact. It's yes. Packed. Yes. And they're all to see Lemmy and Larry. And of course, they knew a good number of the songs we were going to play. Yes. But they never, ever heard them play this way. Wow. Because they were short, three minutes 50, three minutes 30. They were fast, they were violent, they were dangerous, they yes. were much, much louder. Yes. And, and I can still remember this sea of faces, all like with the, <laughs> <laughs> their mouths open. They're just like, what, what are, how are we supposed to react to the, to, to the spectacle that's happening in front of us? Or what are we watching? I don't know. <laughs> absolutely, abs absolutely. And, and yeah. it was so loud. And of course, um, Lemmy wanted to do it so that the audience never had time to recover. So we delivered track after track after track relentlessly. Yeah. Like, you like just driving, driving into the audience. Yeah, literally. And, and literally. And the audience, apart from the complete and utter shock, yeah. were, actually, were actually really loved it. And, and it, 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 hit, it hit the spot. Oh, yeah. And, th oh, yeah. and then we went on around the country doing this. Yeah. And bit by bit, quite, quite quickly, we started seeing Motorhead regalia in the audience. Quite, quite quickly, there were a lot of bikers in the audience because suddenly it was the, the biker band for a start. Hell yeah. Um, because, because, you know, we're in leather, uh, you know, we, we've Denim got some and leather, of the regalia. Yep. Denim and leather, you know, it, it's, it's that, plus, yep. you know, the regalia I told you about. And yep. suddenly we're seeing, oh yeah, and the bullet belts, of course. Yeah. Oh, you know, dude. That, 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 the, the bullet belt, right? Yes. So, so, so suddenly we're seeing bullet belts in the audience, we're seeing leather jackets in the audience. It's, you know, suddenly it's, it's, it's less the hippie thing. Yes, it's more of a rocker thing now. It's now more of a rocker thing, which, of course, the mods and rockers yep. were back into the early 60s in Britain, yep. where one side were mods and one side were rockers. The rockers rode, rode motorbikes yep. and the mods rode scooters, yes. you know, v Vespers and stuff. If you haven't seen it, see Quadrophenia. 
I will. I've never seen it. I will check it out. It's an amazing film. It, Sting is in that film as oh, wow. one of the main actors. He's really good. Okay. It's a really, it's a great film on, on mods and rockers. It's great. Okay, so, I will so, definitely and, watch that. And of course, the mods were all on pills as well. Yes. Like, like The Who. Yeah. And all the bands were in Britain at the time because um, they were playing, a lot of bands, most of the bands were playing more than two, two, two gigs a night. Yeah. In, in different parts of the country. Yeah. Often two hours apart or three hours apart and going to another gig and playing another gig. Yeah. And no days off. The Beatles didn't have any days off. Yeah. For years at all. So, once it started kicking in. Yeah. So they basically just literally take whatever pills or whatever could keep you going and just play as much as possible. Yeah, but, but again, wow. that, was far, that was pharmaceutical speed, nothing like amphetamines. No, definitely not. A amphetamines are very dangerous. They're, yes. they're, they're, uh, I seriously can't recommend them for anybody. <laughs> even, though um, Lemmy, even though Lemmy would do it left and right all the time. Oh, he, insisted, he, insisted, he insisted that everybody around him did it as well. Yeah. No, actually, let me, like, going back, I want to go back to Lemmy for a second and, before, and then t go on to Warsaw Pack because I would really like to talk about that band. But oh. no, no, I just wanted to bring up like you obviously know like like I, I remember, I, I you obviously know the band Killing Joke, right? Obviously, I don't have. Yeah, to, I met them. Yeah. Yeah, I you, I don't have to explain them to you, but so back in the day when they were you know when they were in, in 1980 when they were getting their record out, they used to share a practice space with Motorhead. I know yeah. that blow like when Paul I know the drummer Paul Ferguson when he told me that my my like. You got to understand, like, I'm, I, like I said, I'm, I'm, at the time I was 22, but now I'm 23. But anyways, I'm sidetracked. But as, as, like, whenever someone, like, as you, whenever you drop knowledge on me like that, I just, I simply don't know how to process it. Like, I just, I can't comprehend that because that's just so, like, what do you say? Like, if I was in a situation where I got to go and I'm going to a practice space and it's like Killing Joker on one room and Motorhead are in another room, I would say, dude, what are we doing? Stop. Let's just watch these bands and never play music again. Like, that's the way I would look at it. Honestly, honestly, that's how I would look at it. But Paul was telling me, he's like, yeah, you know what's, you know, I have a funny story about Lemmy. And I go, all right, what is it? And he's like, let me cut my first line of speed. And I went, no, no, he did. And he's like, he cut me. It was either speed or Coke. It was one of those two that. Paul no, 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 N never Coke, never Coke. Okay. Then it was speed. Then Lemmy was telling, not, not Lemmy, Paul Ferguson, he told me, yeah, let me cut my first line of speed. And I ever, and, and the first time I ever did it was with Lemmy. It was at. And, and I'm just like, are you serious? It's like, yeah, he used to hang out with us all the time. And I was like, like, I, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't, I couldn't get that. And like Paul, Paul dropped that knowledge on to me. And I was like, wow, man. So he really, like, he was just a very friendly guy with everyone. He was like, totally, man. And I, I just, I couldn't believe that. <laughs> he was so casual about his love of speed. <laughs> let me. Well, oh well, well more, than, more than, more than that. Let me believed it was a way of life. Now, um, hmm. I've got really mixed feelings about this because uh, in the end, there are very, very few people who have the metabolism of Lemmy or Keith Richards. <laughs> oh yeah. Dude, Lemmy, and, I, how, and, how, and, and, yeah. and, and, and no disrespect, but even Ozzy Osbourne, I'm sorry, he's damaged himself yeah. an awful lot. Oh, of course. Um, and, and, and Lemmy had such a strange metabolism. When he hadn't got speed, he'd inflate. He'd have water retention. Wow. And when he was on, when he was on speed, he was normal or pretty <laughs> much. Wow. <laughs> as normal as you get being Lemmy. Um, Maybe, but, <laughs> his, his body adapted, I guess. They're like, well, this is what he's going to do for the rest of his life. Let's cater to him. Well, that's it. And, and, and um, I mean, you know, we can get onto this in a minute, but I mean, Lemmy's metabolism was very, very weird. You know, yeah. it really was. Yeah. And we were doing a lot of speed and, and we were drinking, um, um, <laughs> we were drinking Carlsberg's special brews, oh my goodness. which was the strong, strongest beer we had in Britain at the time. Yeah. And, and, and Southern Comfort changed chases. And I hate Southern Comfort. It's such a sweet, sickly brew. Okay. But anyway, this is what we were doing. This is our tipple. And it took the edge off the amphetamine because the amphetamine, I mean, God knows what it was cut with. It was probably cut with Ajax or, or Omo or, or some kind of... Yeah, yeah, just to, just to make it go further, you know. Wow. And it was very, very, very rarely um, uh, pure. Okay. And um, and Lemmy used to used to wear a, a, a copper tube. You can probably see that in a few of the photos. Yeah. He used to carry a copper tube on a chain around his neck. Okay. And um, he wouldn't even bother to chop it out most of the time. He'd just grab his bag of speed, stick the copper tube in it, and stick it up your nostril and hold the other nostril 
with his thumb and squeeze hard and go sniff. And it was Russian roulette because you never knew what you were going to get in your nose. Oh my sometimes, God. Some, sometimes it's the whole fucking rock, excuse me, That's whole okay. rock, which would go, go up, up your nose. Oh my and God. You, you, and, you, and, and it was really painful because it was cut with Ajax and stuff. Yeah, oh, of course. And, 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 and the, I mean, remember the first time that, that Larry took it, he, he just went, hang on, I'll put you down in a second to show you. Okay. And Larry just went, yeah. <laughs> And tears are running down his face. Oh my then, goodness! Because it's so painful. Yeah. And of course, it hit your brain, and you never knew what you were getting because you didn't know who'd made this stuff. No, of course not. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the whole problem with it. You know, you have oh no my... idea who, who yeah. made it. Like MDMA, like all these drugs. That's the problem: is who made this? Yeah. You don't know. You no. don't know what you're getting. No. Of and so, not. so, so with the, you, some it's Russian roulette. Sometimes you get a rock up your nose. Sometimes you get you know powder you know etc combination yeah. of the two yeah and you never knew whether you're going to be up all night or whether you're going to up for, for half an hour couple of hours or depending on what you the russian roulette of what went up you know yeah so uh, so that was kind of that and yes lemmy was very gregarious and very friendly with everybody yeah but he was a complete loner yeah wow okay he was always also a complete loner okay okay so uh that's where we're up to on that what, what else you got so, so obviously, so like obviously with with Motorhead, you so you do so obviously we're obviously where we're at in the timeline of Motorhead with with Lucas Fox and Motorhead. So you obviously agree, you both agreed. Let's let's just do a band. Let's do it. So how what were the recording sessions like for On Parole? Because I know Filthy Animal eventually came in, but like, but like you know we don't have to. Well, go well, into- well we can we, we can go into that detail. Um, yeah. So we've done 16 date tours and there are two bootlegs which exist from those tours. One is the roundhouse, which the, okay. the, the, the sound is horrible, but okay. you can hear what the band was doing. Okay. You, you can hear the rough and ready MC5 style. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's like MC5, but it's nothing like MC5 because it's Motorhead. Yeah. Um, different songs, etc. different arrangements. Of course. Um, it's fast, it's furious, etc. The other one's the Blue Oyster Cult support at Hammers with Odeon. Okay. So, 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 so uh, there you can hear what Motorhead was live, okay. that okay. first tour. Okay. Um, when we got to the studio, um, Dave Edmonds, the, the wonderful producer, um, we, we, we arrived late one night. I think it was the something like the 6th or 7th of October. I can't remember the exact date. Okay. 1975. Okay. At the end, uh, before we'd actually finished the tour, we had a couple of dates after it, the marquee and stuff. Okay. And um, and we arrived in Rockfield, and the roadies had set up our, our equipment and stuff. Okay. And then we spent the whole of the next day getting the sound. Okay. And and um, Dave Edmonds got this amazing guitar sound okay. and amazing bass sound, exactly what you were talking about. You know, the uh, yeah. perfect end whistle bass sound, right? Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, and so um, you've got this ama- amazing um, kick-ass sound, if I can say that. Yeah, and, you can um, say that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and and it's, uh, it's amazing. And, but again, the studio is not that big. No. Rockfield is not a big, rich studio. Yeah. And, and it's like, I don't know, twice the size of this place. Yeah. And, um, and my kit's down one of the, the place with basic screens, but not yeah. real there's not real separation. Sure. Um, down the other end, there's, there's the amplifiers with Lemmy and Larry. Sure. Uh, and their microphones and stuff. And so, so there's not complete separation for a start. Yeah. And then Dave Edmonds has set up uh, three lots of Neumann mics as, yeah. as stereo overheads. Yeah. All the way down the studio. Yeah. So everything in that studio is being picked up to these mics because that's what he wants to use gotcha. to get this big sound. Gotcha. Okay, so it's, it's the distance between the mics and the, the equipment gotcha. and the delays between those three, three sets of mics gotcha. that give this big sound on top of the sound you've got gotcha. for the guitars and bass and drums. Gotcha. I detuned my whole kit, which I'd, I'd started doing on tour, okay. so that my frequencies would fit between Larry and Lemmy on the frequency side. Gotcha, you know, okay. okay. The bottom end of Larry and the top end of, of Lemmy. Okay. Um, so, 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 so it was kind of the wall of sound, Phil Spector, Andrew Lou Goldham star. Gotcha. Andrew okay. Lou Goldham, he became, he became the manager of the Stones. He signed when he was 19. Wow. He signed the Stones. Okay. And, and he, he, he basically converted the Stones from being a safe blues band 
yes. into being the into being the dangerous stones. Yes. Before before that, they were wearing uh, 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 like roll neck roll neck woolly jumpers and it, it's corduroy funny, trousers. It, it's funny you bring up like the Beatles and how rough and tough they were. The the Stones were the opposite, from what I know. They were they, they were. were yeah they were a lot more privileged than the Beatles were. Well, yeah, and, and, and Keith Richards was, was an art school boy. Yeah, yeah, they and, were all and, art and school Mick, kids. And, and, and Mick Jagger, well, Mick Jagger wasn't. Mick Jagger went oh, to the London, London, London School of Economics. Okay, wow. And, and even at the beginning of, of, of the Stones, he was still at London School of Economics, still studying. Okay. And, and uh, therefore, he was, a, he was a real brain, you know, a real yeah. business brain. London yeah. School of Economics is, is like Sciences Po in France. It's like one of the top Harvard or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's like one of the top, yeah, top it's a, it's uh, a, universities. It's, yeah. For, 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 for finance and, and economics and political science and stuff. Gotcha. So, 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 so that's, that's the Stones. Gotcha. And, and the Stones are basically uh, imitating uh, blues from the States. Gotcha. And they're great on stage, but Andrew Lou Goldham said himself, he, he didn't believe that the Stones were credible at the time. Okay. And so this, <laughs> what happened is that uh, the Stones couldn't, couldn't write songs. They managed to write a few slow songs. Like a lot of people at the beginning, you, you, you can't quite work, work out how to write songs. No. And, um, and so Andrew Lou Goldham, who's now managing the Stones at the age of 19, yeah. And also producing the Stones in the studio, and wonderful. I loved. I love his production. The first three or four albums are Andrew Lou Goldham. The sound is incredible. Of course, uh, Poison Ivy, uh, yep. all, all those early tracks. Yep, absolutely amazing sound. And um, and Andrew's getting really depressed because he, he's. Uh, they've recorded "Come On," which is their first single. Yeah. And uh, and it didn't really ha do much damage. It didn't yeah. really sell that very well. That well. Yeah, and um, it's I, I love I love come on it's a great track it's the first Stones track I heard of course um, but but he's looking desperately looking for an, you know the follow up track yeah and so he, the, the Stones are rehearsing in the basement of a club yeah uh, in in just around the corner from Piccadilly in yeah. in uh, central London right yeah yeah and he goes out and 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 he goes out really depressed and it's like you know drizzling rain and typical London beautiful weather yeah and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, he goes out and he, he crosses Tottenham Court Road, which is just around the corner. Mm -hmm. And as he's crossing Tottenham Court Road, a taxi pulls up. Gotcha. And, and two drunk guys get out and it's Paul yeah. and John from the yeah. Beatles. Wow. And of, course, and of course, he knows the Beatles really well because he was their publicist. Yes. At the age of 18, the year before. And, uh, and John, who was always very sharp, and Paul as well, they both look at him and go, what's up, Andrew? What's, what, what's wrong? He goes, oh, well, I, I really don't know what to do. Uh, you know, Stones are a great band live, but Jesus, uh, I'm really not sure what I'm going to be able to do with this band because we haven't got a follow-up single and we need a, really need a good single. Yeah. And, and Paul and John, who are drunk, they've just come out of a, an award ceremony because the Beatles are much more famous than the Stones at the time. Yeah. And, um, they, and, and John, John and Paul just look at each other and goes, nah, don't, don't worry, Paul. Don't, don't worry, Andrew. We'll be able to do it. Yeah. So they go down into this CD club basement and, and meet up with the Stones. Yeah. And, um, and uh, they go, and they sh Paul and John and, and um, Keith and Brian sit down, and Paul and John teach them, I want to be your man. Yes. Which is one of their songs. Yeah. Okay. And they craft it in such a way that it could work for the Stones. Yeah. And fortunately, Brian, Brian Jones, gets out his slide and there's, there's this great slide thing which really makes it. And if you don't know that track, check out I Want to Be Your Man. I will. I want to be your lover, baby. I want to be your man. I want to yeah. be your man. <laughs> and it's a great track. And, of, and course. of course, that's that's their first original song written by the Beatles. Of course. Right. So, and the Beatles and the Stones were much closer than everybody gives them credit. Yeah. That they used to call each other up before releasing a, 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 a single. Oh, wow, okay. Or an album. They used to call each other up and say, where are you up to? You know, Paul, Paul would call, call Keith or, yeah. or John would call Mick, etc. Yeah. they go, where are you up to? We're, we're about ready to release. Are you ready to release yet? Yeah. Because they were very wise. They didn't want the Beatles and the Stones to be in the top 20 at yeah. the same time. Yeah. Because okay. they didn't want to divide the public. No, they were... They were... But, they were for the people. The, well, well, the pre, well, more than that, they, they also wanted to sell more. 
<laughs> oh yeah, it's a, from a business perspective. Okay, I guess so, that's so, yeah. So, so the mix was both. You know, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. It was both. You know, yeah. they wanted the max amount of kids to love it, but yeah. they also wanted to sell the max amount of yeah vi vinyl, right? Yeah, of course. So, so so they were very close, and, of and they're all that. The birds, you know, Roger McQueen and, and, and David Crosby, yeah, uh, became very close with with uh, John and George, yes. And um, and uh, in the '64 first tour of the states, the Beatles did. Um, their favourite band was the Birds. Yes, that's the American Birds, yeah. Yep. And um, and so so John and George and um, David and and Roger are hanging out together. So when they come to, to London, the birds, um, naturally enough, the Stones and the Beatles take the, the, take the birds out on the town. Yeah. Every night. Yeah. So, so it's not just the Stones or just the Beatles. It's Stones and the Beatles. Gotcha. And when, when, when the Beatles go back for their second tour of the States, yeah. Brian Epstein, their manager, was very wise. They f he finally gave them six days off yeah. in Los Angeles. And they just played a gig which escapes me uh, somewhere in the States to six, I think it was 65 or 55,000 people, which is the biggest gig ever gotcha. up, and, up until then. Gotcha. Wasn't, wasn't, I don't think it was Shea Stadium. No, that, that was later. Shea, anyway, Stadi Shea Stadium is in New York anyways. That's right. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, no, 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 no. But, but either way, um, okay. they just finished a gig somewhere else. Okay. And then, then the next gig in LA was six days later. Gotcha. So they were okay. just relaxing. Yeah. And Brian Epstein, um, uh, hired Zaza Gabor, the actress's villa yeah. Yeah. in Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills somewhere, yeah. hidden away. And it was a big secret because nobody could know where they were. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise the fans would get to them. Yeah. And so, so, so they arrived there with great relief and this big, big, typical Los Angeles mansion with swimming pools and all the other stuff. Of course. And, um, and they go to bed and, and wake up the next morning and there's like 10,000 fans outside. Wow. They can't get out. They can't get out. <laughs> They're just I like, know, well, it might be 2,000, it might be 3,000, maybe I exaggerate, but it's a lot. They can't yeah. get out. Yeah. And, uh, and so they well, okay, well, in that case, we'll, we'll, we'll bring the party to us. Yeah. They start calling up all their mates, including David Crosby, Roger McQuinn, which John and George are very close to. Yeah. And so, so, so all of these people start arriving at this, this mansion, all the rest of it, at the villa. And, uh, and finally, Roger and, <clears throat> Roger and David turn up and, uh, and John, John and George grab Roger and David and go up to the, one of the bathrooms to, to get away from all the crowd. Yeah. All the, just four of them. Yeah. And one, and one acoustic guitar. Yeah. And, and uh, therefore, um, in turns, they're showing each other various licks and stuff they've, that they've picked up and what they're working on. And, oh, listen to this. It's really cool. You know. And they drop some acid. Oh, okay. And, and so, so there's the four of them um, in, the, in the bathroom, sitting on the edge of the bath and sitting on, sitting on the John and stuff, yeah. um, p passing around the guitar. Yeah. And it's Roger's turn, and, and Roger detunes the guitar. So yeah. He's got a bunch of, bunch of open tuning strings. Yes. And get, gets this drone going. Yeah. And George just looks at it and goes, wow, where'd you get that? That's amazing. I, I want to do something with that. Yeah. And he goes, well, it's funny. We just recorded our album in, in a studio. Yeah. And in that studio, there was this strange Indian gentleman who was also recording, Ravi Shankar. Oh, my goodness. On sitar. Wow. And it, was, it was Roger McGuinn and David Crosby that turned George Harrison onto the sitar. Wow, that and, and is the rest, wild. And the, the rest is kind of history. Yeah, of Everybody, course. Because, of course. We all know that story. <clears throat> All, 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 all the backpackers who went to India to, yep. to get enlightenment yeah. started in a bathroom in LA. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh man. Transcendental meditation. Trans um, the, 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 all of those things started in a bathroom in LA. Great because job. If, if, if Roger McGuinn and David Crosby hadn't detuned that guitar to play to George, yeah. George wouldn't have picked up the sitar and, and done uh, Tomorrow Never Knows, etc. Oh my goodness, that is insane! All right, well let's let's go, let's talk about on What's parole. What's your fact? Oh, oh, no, 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 go on for on parole. That's no, on parole because like we we've had, we've had so many sidetracks. I do want to talk about it because like mo like I'll, I'll explain why. Like, oh yes, we're we're in the studio. You're absolutely yes. right. 
So you're so, in the so, so you're in the studio with on parole, and so what like what was that like 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 obviously you know obviously I know Lemmy he was doing speed left and right while doing it, but like was the recording process smooth? Was there a lot of angst from everyone? Like like how how were you all feeling when you were doing it? You know, it was it was very very jagged. Okay, but um, it was very exciting. The sound was amazing. Okay, and 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 we put all the tracks down quite fast. Okay. <laughs> 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 the speed uh, for once was extremely pure and very dangerous. <laughs> so for the it really was for the studio was... recording. Oh my god! And and and, 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 and Dave Edmonds got you know, Lemmy of of course got everyone taking speed. Yeah. And and Dave Edmonds took took you know a couple of massive lines. Yeah. And suddenly conked out on on the desk like fell asleep. Uh -oh. And then pulled himself together and excused himself. When it threw up, was sick in, in the courtyard, oh came my. back and continued the session. I mean, everyone was, you know, it was, it was well wired, a very wired session. Wow. And, um, and, and I being me, I'd been playing those 16 dates, you know, really giving my Keith Moon to everything. Yeah. And in the state I was in with this really pure speed, it was really dangerous stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I thought I'm going to have to really play it safe here to get, it, get the things down properly at a good speed. Yeah. And a speed. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so I played it straight down the line, Charlie Watts style. Yes. Okay. And, and I, I put my drum tracks down that style. Okay. And, and, and then that was very frustrating for Lemmy and Larry because they wanted this wild stuff that they'd had on the road. Okay. And, um, and at that point in time, I must admit, my brain was pretty frazzled. And we hadn't been eating much. We'd been drinking a lot. Oh and, 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 and the speed was really beginning to take its toll on me. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it because I'm no, so proud and, and uh, happy that I brought my little stone to build the, the basis of this band. Yes. And Larry said it. He, he said, we three invented the mold. Yes. Onto which everything Mote could then graft itself. Yes. But all, but all the arrangements for On Parole was me, me uh, Lemmy and Larry. Yeah. You know, we, we created it. We created yeah. that sound. Yes. And, and then, of course, they needed some, some kind of much, much wilder drum stuff. Yes. Only being a three-piece, bearing in mind. Yes. Um, so they drafted in Filthy to come in to play on my kit. And what's interesting about it, when Warner Brothers sent me the, um, the tracks for yes. On Parole, yes. the remastered version tracks, yes. I suddenly, because everyone said, well, Lucas only played on Lost Johnny. And I'm listening to these things. I'm, I can hear my snare drum on almost all the tracks. Yeah. And I'm going, wait a minute. I can hear it because my snare drum, and I like this sound, just you're going to hear it. You hear that? Bing. Yep. Yep. Right? Yep. I hear, I hear that ping, that okay. ping element. It's got that ping on it. Yep. Now, Dave Evans loved that because it meant he couldn't, he didn't have to use volume yeah. to have my snare drum cut through. Gotcha. So as a result, the guitar and bass could be much higher in the mix. Gotcha. And make, and make it sound much more powerful. Gotcha, okay. So you can hear that cloon, that cloon, that's what Larry called my cloon. Gotcha. Okay, cloon. Cloon. And you can hear that cloon on almost every track on, on parole. Okay. Any version you like. Okay. And then you can also hear um, Filthy's snare drum because he used his snare drum on my kit on my cymbals. Yes. He brought in his snare drum. Yeah. And you can hear his snare drum. Okay. As well as the clune. Okay. So you you can hear both on this new remastered version. You can hear what really was because all those overhead mics. Yes. Picked up whatever I'd played. Yes. Through the overhead mics. Gotcha. So you could you couldn't wipe that off and keep, still keep the ambience. Gotcha. So that so therefore you have two drummers on on parole. Gotcha. Wow. So that's how, okay. Interesting. Because we could, we would, it's not like there's total separation. No. It's what, I, what I'm saying. It wasn't a drum booth. No. It wasn't a drum booth where, okay. where the drums wouldn't, wouldn't, what we say is piss into the other mic, 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 microphones. It wouldn't leak into, the sound wouldn't leak into the other microphones. Yeah. Okay. Which, which is what we do nowadays. We have a, have a drum booth and then we have booths to put the guitar amp and the bass amp separate. So you have full separation. So you can replace anything you want on the on, on the recording. Yeah. This this wasn't recorded like that. This was recorded yeah. much more 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 edgy and live. Therefore, inevitably, you hear both drummers. Nice. Both both drummers are on, 
which which the press release talks about you know the press worldwide press release for this album they actually talk about the fact that you can hear you know both drummers on on the tracks that filthy overdubbed on as well yes <clears throat> so 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 that was that session and then we went on and played the marquee where john kale of velvet underground um uh uh, contacted me afterwards and, and he, he said he wanted me to join his band and okay. I said no way no way Jose I'm in Motorhead this is my band uh, you know I, I'm Lemmy's mate I'm Lemmy's side man yeah. you know there's no way I'll, I'll join your band and of course just after that well <laughs> I was out of the band <laughs> right yeah Beca because Filthy had done such a one I mean Filthy what a wonderful guy yeah and, and, and a great drummer yeah uh, but of course he was basically a soul drummer that went wild <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and, and and um, he was a soul drummer before that gotcha. in soul bands. And, um, and, and when, once he started kicking with the double bass drum, he really invented something that sounded like a, uh, some kind of Heinkel. Or, or, it, it, it sounds like uh, uh, ten, 10 Harley Davidson's, Harley Davidson's on speed. Yeah, basically. Oh, totally. You know? I mean, I, I mean, like, I, like, I mean, I remember every time I listen to like the open, the opening track to Overkill, like, do 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 na 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 na. It just opens up with the double. It's so like, like his double bass style was just so pounding and just so, it it had such a pound. And as you said, like, you know, Harley Davidson engines on speed. I mean, it basically. It basically was that, especially for the time, which was like 78 when that album came out, you know? I, I mean, not forgetting that yeah. John Heisman of Coliseum had double bass drums. Yes. Um, uh, you know, John Bonham had double bass drums. Yep. No, John Bonham didn't. He had no, he didn't. He, he had 24 or 26 inch bass drum. Yes. Um, Ginger Baker uh, had double bass drums. G Ginger Baker had double bass drums. And way before that, of course, Keith Moon. Yep. But nobody had done this. Yeah, that constant. So, so, so that's, you know, hats off to Phil. That, yes. that was pure Phil. Yeah. That, that when, when he started getting into that stuff. Yeah. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, how did you feel about the fact that, you know, that, that United Artists who, who signed Motorhead, uh, who, who we were signed, who um, Hawkwind was signed to? Yeah. How did you feel about the fact that United Artists didn't bring the album out? And why didn't they bring the album out? Yeah. Now, I put myself in a record company hat and I know Martin Davis, who was the president of United Artists at the time. Yeah. And Andrew, Andrew Lauder, who was, who was the A&R man. Yeah. When they received the, the, uh, the album. Yeah. They didn't know what they had in their hands at all. Nothing existed like that. Yeah. Nothing existed. Listen, put yourself in the hat of an A&R man. You just signed a band and one member from Pink Fairies, one member from Hawkwind. What do you think they're going to sound like? Pink Fairies and Hawkwind. Of course. And they sounded nothing. We sounded nothing like that. Yeah. And therefore, they didn't know what to do with it. Therefore, they basically put it on. They, they shelved it. Yeah. And that really pissed, obviously, Larry off and Lemmy off and me off. Yeah. Of course. And, and, and Larry, you know, split the band soon after because he realized that nothing was going to happen. Yeah. And as far as he was concerned, he, he, he jumped ship because, you know, he didn't think anything was going to happen for Motorhead. Yeah. Which, you know, bless him, I kind of understand that. You know, yeah. Larry wanted to, you know, his career to get on and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and Lemmy had a very rough time. We all did. Uh, that first year it was, was, it was exciting. It was amazing. It was over the top. It was, you know, the girls was great. And, <laughs> and again, uh, you know, again, that thing about girls and Lemmy and, Another thing that Lemmy and I had, apart from riding horses, we did like to ride girls. But, but it was, um, we had an approach to women, which was, which was not the big macho approach. Although a lot of the time you hear about him going, oh, well, well, women, women, girls, you know, he, he was extremely respectful. Yeah. Uh, I would even go as far as to say, I'm a feminist. I know I am. Yeah. And I believe, and I believe for me, feminism is just equality. Yeah, no, that's the way it's I look at simple, it. It's simple, simple, simple yeah. as that. You no, know, I, 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 I'm on the same page. I do. I'm, I'm the same way as you. Trust me. How, 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 how the hell can 49% of the world be superior to 51% of the world that are, that are women? Yeah. It's just impossible. I cannot no. look at that. You yeah. know, uh, you've no, got a mother, right. you've got a sister, I've yep. got a mother, I've got a sister. Yeah. How, how can I even think of treating my mother and my sister in that way? Yeah. Because it's a girlfriend. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, no, so exactly. it's, 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 it's also this thing of very old fashioned, maybe. It's the attitude of why are you on stage? You're a bass player. Yeah. Vivek? Yes. You're a bass player. Yeah. When you get on stage, what are you there to do? 
I'm there to thrash and play. I've never. I'm just there to play. That's my mentality. Okay, but why? What's your goal on stage? It's funny, man. Like it. it like I've. I've actually never. Like I've never played a show before. Like like I do. I am working on music with a friend, but my goal is just. I just want to play. Like I want to see where I can go with as a bass player. If that makes sense. Like I. Just it want- does. It, it. It makes complete sense. Except it's yeah. not where I'm at. Yeah. Now listen. To, listen. Um, basically, it's it's old school. People go through lives being mechanics, being electricians, being working in factories, working in real estate, working yeah. all these things. Yeah. That, and they're but they're basically music fans. Yeah. Their dream would be to be on stage. Yes. Right. They go to a concert. They spend hard-earned money sometimes when they haven't got any money. Yep. Oh yeah. They go. They go to a concert and they want to get off. Yes. They want to get off. Yes. And for me, old school, if you're on stage, your responsibility, your prime responsibility is to the fans. Yes. You should be there to get those fans off. Yes. Those fans are paying your wages. Yes. Those fans are paying for the albums. They're not paying for stupid Rolls Royces and Manners. No. They are paying your wages. Yeah. And if those fans aren't there for you, you don't exist. Yeah. No, so, that's so, very true. So basic respect. Yes. Now, when I'm on stage, that's the way I play. I want to get that audience off. And I give with full hearted, not wanting a re- reaction. In the end, I don't care. Yeah. But I want to get those people off. Yeah. If they get off, and seriously, they get off, and you get this big rush of enthusiasm and, and communication between the stage and the, and the crowd, the crowd of the stage, yeah. then you're starting to achieve what you should be doing, which is being there. Yeah. That's your job. You're an you're a effing entertainer. Yes. Right. For me, in bed, it's the same thing. <laughs> of course. No, of course. Uh, men and women have different sexuality. Of course. Therefore, um, men in general are there like performing. When you're on stage and you're not getting the audience off, you're there like performing dogs in a circus act. Yeah. Where you're just showing off what you know how to do. Yeah. Look yeah. at me. I'm like clever. Yeah, but I'm doesn't. Sorry. I'm sorry. That's jerking off. Yeah. No, I mean it doesn't that, mean that, anything. That's, that's you know? not making. That's not making love to the public. Yeah. That, no. That's not getting the audience off. No. Of it's the not. same in bed. Yeah. Men should wake up to that because yeah. I've had a wonderful, wonderful sex life because I was educated by very, very wonderful women oh. from the age of thirteen. Nice. Where, where I was going out with girls who were like two years older than me and yeah. taught me about this stuff. Yeah. And said, no, 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 women are not like that. You know, women don't have the same sexuality as men do. Yeah. We of get off in a different way. It takes longer. It take, we need uh, a lot of, you know, easing into it. We need foreplay, all this stuff. And yeah. men just sort of go, oh, I've got a dick. I've got a dick between, the, between my ears. Uh, I want to come. Yeah. No, it's not about that. It's making love. Yeah. And it's this whole thing of building. And once you start building between the stage and the audience, between the man and the woman, you start building this thing. It yeah. becomes amazing because the exchange, once you've given so much yeah. to get the other person off, yeah. once the other person getting off, what are they going to do? They're going to get you off. Yeah, exactly. And that's it, the principle. That's, see, that makes sense. That's a, very, that's, that's a very good analogy. But like, no, you were saying with, like, with, with Lemmy and you, but with, you, know, you, and, you and Lemmy and with women, it's like you both were very respectful because you both were mindful of what they wanted, more, than, more so of what you wanted. You know, oh, yeah. you, are, you already knew what you want, but you, but you were more mind, but it was just like with them, it's like, this is what they want. Let's go with that. Yes. And, 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 and it's, it's more than that. Oh, my um, bad. Uh, no, no, I, I'd go, go a little bit further than that because yeah. basically my real pleasure is, is giving and, and getting the other person off. Yeah. As a result, the pleasure that comes back is, is tenfold. Gotcha. That's the point. Therefore, it, it is also selfish. Gotcha. It's, it's not selfish just me getting myself off. Yeah. You know, I'm on stage showing what I, I, I've, I've rehearsed this to death. I'm really good at this. Watch this. Yeah. Aren't I, aren't I clever? Aren't yeah. I a great performing dog in the circus? Yeah. No, no, no. It's the same thing. You see? So, so, so for me, that this, is, this is a primordial. You know, what, you know what rock and roll means, don't you? Yeah, of course. Do you? 
Well, I have my the word, own. The words. The words. The rock and well, I have I school me on it. I could be wrong, but l- give me give me your definition of it. Okay, rock is like a rocking horse. Yes. Forward back movement. Yes. Roll is like on a boat. It's the oh, other way. Oh yeah. It means sex. Yeah. Oh. Rock and roll means sex, and it comes from the bordellos. It comes from the brothels. Oh, I see. Okay, the, the Afro-American brothels was where it started. Okay. Hmm. And uh, if you go, to, go back to Bessie Smith and all these wonderful blues singers, they started yeah. in brothels. Yeah. And their job as lady singers was to sing extremely pornographic lyrics. So the men, when they finally got to go upstairs with the ladies of the night, yeah. they would come quicker. Oh. Therefore, they get through more men earn more money. Oh, I Therefore, see. Therefore, the, these girls singers who entertained the men while they were waiting to go up yeah. were extremely important to the brothel wow. because they met the brothel earn more money. Wow, okay. Therefore, the dirtier and the more pornographic the lyrics, the better. Wow. If you listen to the original, you know, of course you know, um, Ain't nothing but a hound dog. Uh, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. That that's where because, oh because you ain't no friend of mine. I got you. The, okay. The original version is you can shake your tail, but I ain't gonna buy you no more. Ah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, so, but, but I mean seriously, you go you go into brothel lyrics, and they are just um, absolutely amazing. Do you wow. remember um, Led Zeppelin, the Lemon Song? Yes, I do. I do remember that. Song. Okay. Now we probably can't say that over the air. No, of course but, not. But, uh, okay. <laughs> But it illustrates what we're talking about. Yes, it does. That rock and roll is not just about the music. Yeah. It's also about the sexual um, trigger. Yes. Between the audience and, and the stage. Gotcha. That's, that's why I'm saying this parallel. It's that's... so important to realize wow. that, that, that we, we are there to, to, to get them to dream. Because it's not like just like the cinema. Yeah. You know, why, why do you go to the theater? And I'm talking about theater, live theater. Yeah. Rather than cinema, because because it's dangerous. Yeah. Because something can go wrong. Someone can have a heart attack on the stage. Yeah. Why do you go to a gig rather than just watch MTV? You go because it's dangerous. Yeah. You don't go to listen to the album. Yeah. No, you go. And therefore, all, all these bands that get on stage and just play the album exactly like the album, I'm sort of going, oh, what a shame. Yeah. Because in the end, once you write a song. Then it has a hundred different versions. Yep, that's true. No, that's different. That's, array, different and that's the beauty of it. Listen, yeah. all, all along the all along the Watchtower, the Hendrix, the Hendrix song. Yeah. It's a Dylan song. Yeah. Listen to the original, which I love, and listen to the, the other one. Yeah. Now, if I can pick you up on one little word you said earlier, and then then, then we'll nip on to Warsaw Pack. You said the greatest drummer or the greatest bass player in the world. Now, nine times out of ten, when I walk off stage. Almost lots of people will say, oh, Lucas, that was great. Listen, I always wanted to be a musician, um, but, but I, you know, and I go, listen, everybody can't be a musician, otherwise there'd be nobody in the audience. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Res- re- respect for the fans. Yeah. Which is all the same, same story, right? Yeah. And the other thing is, they go, okay, Lucas, well, which, who's the greatest drummer in the world for you? And I go, I don't even think like that. Oh. I just lo- in, in In France, we say, at the end of a meal, you can, you can have dessert or cheese. And I'm going, I want both. Yeah. How, how the hell can you say that Hendrix is better than Beethoven? How the hell can you say that Marcel Duchamp that, no. is better than the Sex Pistols? No. How, no. how can you say that Picasso is better than Rubens or, no, or Van Gogh? Yeah. yeah. How, how can you say that the Beatles are better than the Stones? Have both of them. Yeah. You don't, listen. It's, it's the beauty of the arts, all yeah. the arts. Yeah. They're, they're not a sport. Yeah, no. No, they're, it's Therefore, not. in the end, it's not competition. It's an exhibition. It's an exhibition rather than a competition. It's an exhibition of an individual. Yes. It's the individual's eccentricities which are interesting about the arts. Yes. Not the, not the fact that he's the first to, to, to run the mile. Yes. And, and get there before everybody else. It's how he runs the miles what matters. Yes. Yeah, it's it's, it, it, it's the journey. Yes, it's where you take the audience. Yeah, and for for me, do you remember Captain Beefheart? Oh man, I haven't listened to him in a while, but I do I do know Captain Beefheart. Yes, I do. 
Do you know Clear Spot? I don't, I don't actually, I don't. Okay, well, it was the most unpopular b album for his fans. Oh, okay. It's an amazing album. Okay. And on that album, there's one moment where there's a guitar solo, which is one note on a slide guitar. And it just goes, Wow. And it goes on and on and on. And he just goes, play that lunar note. Now, that one note guitar solo speaks more to me than, than those thousands of notes played fast. Really? Yeah. Because, but that, that, you know, the hair on the back of my arm goes up just thinking about it. Wow. So, so, so for me, the beauty of the arts is the, the variety of different bands. Yes. When Nirvana came along, suddenly Guns N' Roses looked like they were old fashioned. Yeah, that's when true. Mo when Motorhead came along, suddenly, yes, Genesis, all these bands, suddenly, again, when the Sex Pistols, when particularly the Dam came along, suddenly all the old bands just looked so old fashioned. That's true. And this is, this is the beauty of it. It's the difference which matters. Yes. It's not copying somebody else. Yes. No, now, of course. Now, when, when you're learning your craft, apart from when you're the Damned or the Sex Pistols or the Clash, who we knew well, um, when you're learning your craft, you have a tendency to always copy things you love, of course. Yes. yes. But where it becomes interesting is when you spit it out in your own way. Yeah. When you put your own cowboy boots on. Yeah. Which don't, which don't smell of the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's when you've got your own pair of cowboy bits and you're walking your own path yeah. where things get interesting. And it's where you, creation starts with disobedience. Yes. No, of course. N not with obedience. Of course. Therefore, it, it's, it's not, for me, it's not going to guitar school that's going to teach you how to be a, an interesting um, an interesting guitarist who's going to bring something new to the world. Yeah. It's how you break the rules. Yeah. It's... Because otherwise, if, if you're following, listen, if I've just written a song yeah. and I've written a song identical to that. Yeah. I'm not breaking my own rules. No. I need, I, I need to destroy that first song in its own way. Yeah. When I'm writing a new song, I need to write something different. Yeah. So, hence Pink Fairies, you know, I wrote seven out of the eight tracks on that album. Nice. And, I mean, and, 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 you know, that, that's, for me, that's what creation is all about, is, is the difference between people. You know, everyone's got their own thumbprint. So, so, so let's be more. Let's be more ourselves. No, of course. Not that's trying. A... We, we can't be like anybody else. No. I'm not like everybody else. <laughs> right? Yeah, of course. We, we can't be anybody else. Therefore, why not just try and be yourself? No, and as, I mean. As much as possible. Of course. No, I mean, people's differences are what make them unique and and quite frankly, that's what makes the world a more interesting place. If everyone was the same, it would suck. There would be nothing, there, would, there wouldn't be much to look forward to. And, and it's always the, the, the eccentrics, the yeah. eccentrics, yeah. Who, who are not following the rules, yeah. that the, the, the end bring, bring, bring innovation. Yes, they always bring innovation, they always bring something new, and they make, you know, they make, they live, they live a much more fulfilling and interesting life because they're doing it for themselves. Yeah, you know, and, and and doing it for themselves, and also um, a painter yes. when he's painting in his, his his solitary studio. Yeah, in some ways those paintings exist, but in some ways they don't exist until they confront an audience. Yes, they don't really exist. Yeah, Th therefore, again, it's you're not really ever just doing it for yourself. Yeah, yes, you've got to please yourself first because because you know your own taste or. Whatever. But yeah. in the end, once you've got that, once you've got your own style, you've got your own songs, whatever, then it's a question of confronting with an audience yeah. and trying to see if you can get your audience off yes. playing these songs. Yes. Not just show, showing off, you know, oh, look, I, I, I can do my scales faster than the other guy. Yeah, but it's more about, does this have any meaning to the audience? Does this mean something? Can they go, can they go back to, can they go, yeah, does it raise their hair? Can they go back home saying, whoa, that was insane. He took every convention I liked about music, but did something different with it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, one, uh, one guy I admire and just adore, Lenny Kravitz. He's oh, amazing. Oh, amazing. But, but I would have so liked Lenny Kravitz to be much more original because every single track he's done, which I adore, he's done some great tracks. And really, really, he's so talented. Yeah. But 
almost all of his tracks I can go, oh yes, that came from the Beatles, that came from the Stones, that came. From... I, I, I can spot, I can spot his influences too too well. Yeah. Like early Prince, Prince, I, I can look at early Prince and go, that's James Brown, James Brown, uh, uh, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, so it's it's looking at, looking at the whole of music stuff. I mean, Lemmy was like this too. Yeah, L- Lemmy Lemmy wasn't just a a mono music type person. No, definitely not. I mean, I mean, in interviews, he'll talk about old rock from the '60s. He'll talk about. I mean, he loved everything, man. Punk, old school rock and roll, even like even like, and even he even had an appreciation for like the more extreme side of metal too. I mean, he he. Oh he yeah, loved, yeah. Like he loved everything. Like like I would always see photos of Lemmy hanging out with like. Not only like you know, obviously with like all the cla- like with all the old, old original punk rock bands, all all like those old hippie bands, but I would also see him hanging out with like the Cro-Mags from New York, and like obviously all these old like hardcore bands from like you know from the states, and eventually like you'd even see him hanging out with like death metal bands like Christian from Brazil, for example. And I'm just like, how is he able to do all of that? That's amazing to me. Like he like he was able to like app- he was able to find appreciation for music that he himself influenced, you know. Yeah, well, well, well I, I mean, <laughs> if you like, part of that thing is this thing of, I mean, obviously, this, this, this will be a surprise to no one. Lemmy was the biggest Beatles fan I've ever met. Really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Biggest Beatles fan I've ever met. And, and not just early Beatles. You know, it was, it was also the craft, the, the, the whole thing. Yeah. He, he also loved Joni Mitchell. Okay. Court and Spark. If you want to, if you want to chill out to an amazing album, it's called Court and Spark, Joni okay. Mitchell, okay. and that was one of Lemmy's favourites as well. Okay. So, 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 so it's 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 looking really broadly. Hang on, is that my? That might be just my phone. Yes, it is. Hang on, I've got to just plug you in. Just no one worries. second, and, no and, and, and no. then, no then if we can finish up on Warsaw Pact, if that yes, would do you. We will. Hang I have Paul. I Paul, I've just been enjoying our conversations. That's why I've, I haven't really changed the topic. <laughs> no problem, mate. Yeah. Oh. Now, is that, is that now working? No power mode. Are you back? I'm back. Yeah, I'm okay. back. I'm back. I'm back. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. Um, so, so, all of that. I mean, after I left Motorhead, um, then I went through a really hairy patch. I went and delivered flowers for a bit to get me off of off speed and stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and that was quite funny because I started at 7.30 in the morning and, and all the other flower deliveries uh, finished at 4.30 in the afternoon. Yeah. And I was still delivering flowers at 9.30 at night because my brain was so damaged I couldn't remember where parts of London were. Damn. So, so <laughs> yeah. Um, and then started getting back into, uh, in, into bands and stuff and played at the Greyhound and all these, you know, mythical places. Yeah. And, um, and then, of course, the Warsaw Pact. Yeah. And the Warsaw Pact was just wonderful. And of course, there was John Manley who'd been living with Paul, uh, John Manley became Johnny Walker, who'd yeah. been living with Paul Rudolph. Um, there was Andrew, Andrew Calhoun. Uh, they had a band called The Rockets, which is great. Yep. And again, like happens in bands all the time, I replaced a very good drummer called Wolf. Gotcha. So Wolf, Wolf was re- replaced, replaced by Fox. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and the rest is history. And of course, we did the album, which was... Uh, the fastest album ever recorded. Nice. And, and it was d- direct to disc in, 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 you know, in the middle of the punk new wave movement. Yeah. And, and it was a reaction against all these, um, all these bands that spent five months to do an album. Yeah. And Mim Scala, our wonderful manager, lovely guy, and uh, who used to hang out at Keith Richards, still alive, still a wonderful guy. He's 80, 80 a brilliant sculptor, wo- um, wood craftsman. He's an amazing guy. Yes. And, and he had this concept in his brain to record direct to disc, no mix. Therefore, the mix would be mixed like a mic live. Yeah. And then it would record direct to disc, no tape. Therefore, it would be the most pure and edgy sound you could possibly get. Yeah. And that was the concept of the album. And therefore, we went in at uh, 10 o'clock at night at Island's, uh, Trident Studios. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'll go just real back a fraction. We were signed to Island Records. Yeah. Island Records at the time had a, uh, a chairman called Martin Davis. Mm-hmm. Martin Davis was the president of United Artists when I was signed to United Artists with Motown. Gotcha. So suddenly I picked up the trail with Martin, Martin again. And um, in Island Records, when we recorded the single called Safe and Warm, uh, which I have here somewhere, oh, which is on this new released version. There you go. Safe and Warm. Gotcha. Nice. This is 
This is the new released version of Warsaw Pact. And in Island Records, in St. Peter's Square, Hammersmith, just between Hammersmith Odeon and Chiswick, where I was living when I was a kid, um, at Island Records, therefore in the basement of Island Records, there was Studio A, Studio B, Studio C. Sure. Doing safe and warm for a few days, five days or something. Safe and warm and sick and tired, the B-side. Sure. Um, Warsaw Pact were in Studio B. In Studio A was Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Wow. In Studio, in Studio C was Bob Marley. Wow. And, and, the, and the Whalers, right? And so every time um, Studio C's door opened, the whole corridor filled with thick smoke. <laughs> oh, I could. Hey, man, they that they must have been hitting it real hard. If they were, wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that that was the Warsaw Pact, and therefore we went on to Trident Studios to record directed this. We went in at ten o'clock at night, recorded side A once, side B once, then we recorded side A again and side B again, Got and it. we chose the better of. A and A and B and B. Got and that became the album. And nothing existed before we started. Not one cover. Nothing. Wow. And therefore, we did these cover ourselves. We stayed up all night, just yeah. again. Yeah. And did all these stamps and all the rest of it. We stamped personally. Nice. Three of the Warsaw, three of the Warsaw Pack, me, John, and Andy, yeah. spent all night stamping 5,000 of them. Nice. So, <clears throat> while we were stamping these covers, the matrix the master the mother you know, the master was taken from the cutting lathe by sports car yeah breaking all the speed limits going up to the 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 um the um the processing plant that converted into the mother which becomes the negative which is what makes the albums which prints the albums yeah and then the same sports car was driven, driven across to the, the 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 factory the yeah. pressing plant where they printed up 5,000 in one night. Yeah. Those 5,000 were then delivered to, um, to where we were. Yeah. And we had people packing those 5,000 into these sleeves. Yeah. These sleeves were the sleeves that they used to send albums out. They put the album inside that sleeve. Yeah. This is the thing that they used to send the sleeves out yeah. uh, by post. Yeah. They used to send albums in, this, in these sleeves. So, so nothing existed before we started work. Gotcha. This is how it made the Guinness Book of Records. Gotcha. And uh, at 11 o'clock the next morning, we were in Virgin Records in Marble Arch, just down the road from where I used to live. Gotcha. Marble Arch, just by Hyde Park Corner, etc. Marble Arch, before gotcha. the beginning, beginning of Oxford Street. Gotcha. And we were signing those, those albums in that, in, in that record store that is for wild. the fans. Gotcha. And, uh, and the thing about it was, of course, it was a great idea on paper. It was a great idea sound-wise. And if you go on, on, uh, on YouTube, you can see six or seven of the tracks yeah. being, being, being um, filmed in black and white. It's great. It's, it's really raw. Gotcha. And, and there, there you see what's on the album. And, and I, I'm really proud of it. I love it. It's a gotcha. great album. Gotcha. And, uh, and it's really edgy. But gotcha. of course, the record companies at the time, because, because bands used to take three, four, five months to record an album and more, they used to get their bands really seriously indebted to them because the bands inevitably in the deal gotcha. the bands end up the, the 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 record company needs to recoup its money gets its money back yeah the money it invests on in the studio it gets its, it, it takes that money back yeah from all the first sales gotcha first two thousand four thousand ten thousand sales gotcha therefore they held the ba the bands by the short and curlies by the balls yeah and therefore they had them indebted to them so they could control the bands. Gotcha. Right. The studios were delighted to have bands in there for five months. That in those days, 200 to 500 pounds a day. Just imagine you're in pure punk and new wave era, fast, furious, immediate music yeah. with bands going on stage, hardly being able to play and wonderful at it. Yes, because they had, they haven't they haven't spent ten years like I did yeah. getting there from the age of nine to the age of nineteen or twenty. Yeah, they they just picked up a guitar and go, okay, I've got three chords, I'm going to play them well. Yeah, and they just hammer those three chords. Yeah, and that's what punk is all about, which is yeah. that immediate immediacy and yeah. that fresh approach. You yeah, know, Nirvana, etc. And so you imagine that the studios didn't want 
this to catch on. And the record companies didn't want this to catch on either. Yeah. Because it was completely against their business model. Yes. So after the 5,000 copies sell, sold in a week for an unknown band, 5,000 copies sold in a week, they stopped pr pressing them. Oh, wow. And, yeah. Yeah. They stopped pressing them. So, so basically the business ganged up on us. Oh, dang. Yeah. And, and therefore Warsaw Pack, we went on for 18 months after that, you know, promoting the album and stuff like that. But bit by bit, the rug was pulled out from under our feet. There was no more promotion coming from the record company. Damn. Yeah. And then I went on to other bands, lots of other bands, which, you know, I can, you can read the book or we can talk about another time. Yeah, of course. But no, I mean... So, so there you go. So, 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 so what, what other bits would you like to, to know about? And, and then I must, I must love you and leave you. Well, and, and no, of course. And say enormous, enormous hugs to all you fans out there. Of course. And I repeat, none of us would be here without you. Yes. Uh, pure respect for you guys. Lemmy would be saying exactly the same thing. Of course. You know, uh, pure respect for you guys. You, the fans, are what make bands. Yes. You know, the fans are Motorhead. Yes. Uh, as much as Motorhead is Motorhead and much as I'm the only survivor of the first, I think it's three formations of Motorhead. Yes. Um, and, and, uh, you know, Mickey D and, and, and Phil great what they managed to do for all those years yep. they were in the band with Lemmy afterwards. Yes. Full respect. And yes. that last album, uh, Black, oh, yeah. what is it? Bad Black, magic. Black, Bad Magic. Yeah. I just love that. album. No, that great. album was awesome. I mean, I, I mean, motor it was uh, like, I'll like, for me, with when it comes to old school heavy metal, Motorhead is always my favorite because I can go to any decade and I'll still find a record that I'll go that I'll do backflips for, and mm. you know, like like I don't have that. I'm not. I, I don't have that with other bands. With with Motorhead, there was this there was this sound that was so consistent, but because it was so raw, dirty, mean, and in your face that it could just work in any time period, and I'd go nuts for it. As oh, it, it, it kind of doesn't go out of fashion. I think no, it, it it never does. Like Motorhead are cool. Like let me let me has stated Motorhead are the are the best underdog band of all time, and I totally agree with that. I completely agree because their sound is just so like it's just so against of what everything of like whatever like it, it's just it's such a unique sound for metal punk and rock that it just works. It no matter where you are, it just works. And you yeah. and obviously thank you for that. Thank you for developing that sound. Well, well, my pleasure. And, and, and one of the touching things was um, the last time I saw Lemmy was in 2014 when he came to Paris yeah. uh, with, with Motorhead to play with um, Skew Sitskin and The Damned yeah. supporting them. And I went to this gig with my backstage pass and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I, I knew I was going to be uh, hooking up with Lemmy again. We hadn't seen each other for many years. And the last time we'd seen each other, all the bands I was in after Motorhead, Motorhead, suddenly Lemmy would be in the audience and we'd go and have a, a beer after the gig and we'd, we'd chew the fat and have a good laugh and stuff like that. So, yeah. so you know, Lemmy and I stayed very close. Yeah. Um, and then when I came to start living in France, we, we, we didn't see each other for many, many years. Yeah. So finally I get to uh, go, go to the Zenith in Paris yeah. and, and, and see, see uh, Skew Sitskin and, and The Damned, uh, great gigs. Yeah. Um, and I love Skew Sitskin. Nina's just wonderful singer. Yes. Um, and the damned, of course. And yeah, of course. I, I hadn't seen Captain Sensible for years. And yeah. so that was fun to meet him again. And uh, he, he was just like bowled over that, that I was there. Yeah. And um, I walked in into the, in, into the uh, dressing room. You know, it was the backstage. Yeah. Uh, with my backstage pass. And the guy running the whole backstage, the American guy uh, running it for Lemmy, walked up to me and shook my hand warmly and said, listen, uh, Lemmy knows you're here and uh, it's going to take a little while before you get to see him, but uh, he knows you're here. You can spend a little time with him. It's going to be good. And then he walked away and came back two minutes later and said, oh, by the way, uh, the chef is a really good chef. So, you know, ask for whatever you want, you know, any, any world dish you know, he'll be able to cook it. You know, if you're hungry, you know, and the bar's an open bar. If you want anybody to bring you drinks, so we're all here for you. Yeah. Everybody knows you're here. And I said, oh, that's really sweet because I, I was very touched by this. Yeah. And he said, and he took my hand one more time. He said, can I just tell you that nobody, nobody would be in this Zenith if you hadn't been there for Lemmy in 1975. Yeah. Lemmy, wow. Motorhead wouldn't exist if you hadn't been for him. And I just never thought of it like this. It never crossed my mind that it'd been that so important. I've just been a, a good guy. I've been his, his close mate and... Of course, you know, uh, 
let's let's do it you know yeah and, and i can remember all that stuff about him not wanting to have his own band because it was too much grief you know yeah. i can fully understand that it's, it's a lot of grief running a band yeah and uh, and so so you know it was we spent two and a half hours together yeah and every time that uh, we, he did photo calls and stuff with the dam and goose it and stuff and and the first time we did this big photo call and stuff and uh, and and let me you know cut it really short and he said right clear the dressing room right and i stood up to leave and he said no not you lucas sit down we're not finished and i sat down and just me lem and tim his uh, his bass tech yeah. who's his his best mate and just the three of us chewed the fat for two and a half hours until finally there was nobody else in the zenith anymore yeah. And the Zenith management came in and said, listen, you're going to have to leave. We're, we're closing. Yeah. And, and finally at two o'clock in the morning, or whatever it was, you know, we walked out in the car park and uh, I saw Lemmy onto the bus and he said, well, see you, Lou. It's good to see you. Yeah. And as he painfully climbed the steps of the bus and the door closed to the bus, I realized that was the last time I'd ever see Lemmy. Wow. Hmm. It, it, it hit you. It's like this, is the, like this was your goodbye, basically. If this is our goodbye, yeah. He was already very sick, you know. Yeah. Stage. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. But so man. voila. So voila. That's. Uh, well, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, Mr. Fox. I mean, like, th Lucas, th Lucas. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, but seriously, like, like I will definitely see what I can. Like, this is definitely gonna. I'll, I'll try to make sure all this stuff goes on the air. My show's usually an hour long, but we went way more for an hour. But I can, I can get him to air all of it. Don't worry about it. But like. Th thank you again for doing this and I appreciate you for doing this and being patient with me as well. Uh, I loved everything you had to say was really cool, very insightful and very just well-spoken and very eloquently put. And I thank you for that. Seriously, I do. Well, Viva, my real pleasure. I think you're wonderful, man. And, and thank you. you know, I, I really hope you get managed to get your Rickenbacker sorted out. Oh and, man, and, I... and, and, and you got you got a long future in front of you. You're a great guy, man. Thank you. And I... and, and, and and just just to say, do you want me to do some little uh, some little thing for your radio? Sure, <clears throat> sure. If you okay. know if if you want to do a radio ID, go ahead. Okay. This is Lucas Fox, the founding mem member of Motorhead with Lemmy Kilmister, and we're on WGMU Radio. And it's Death Wave. Death and, Waves. Death Waves. Ah, this is Lucas Fox, founder member with Lemmy from Motorhead on WGMU, Death Waves, and Be There or Be Square. I've had fun doing this with Vivek, great radio station. Thank Take you. care of yourselves. Thank Stay you. safe out there. Mask up, rock out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me, let me stop the recording.